Okay, great. We're good. We're alive and ready to go. How are you doing, Alexander? I'm very well. Extremely beautiful day outside in London, by the way. Gorgeous day. And um, um, a day after, after we finished in the late evening, I get to go out and have a short time by, to myself. My wife has consented to let me free to go to a pub and have a drink for once. Because I haven't done that for a while when you're looking after children. It's not something that you can do. But they're getting, they're getting, uh, uh, they're getting easier to handle. They're growing up fast, and now I've had that opportunity to do it finally. It's a beautiful day here in London. Tomorrow it'll be her turn. Mm -hmm. Great. Great to hear. Welcome, everybody. Everyone joining us on Locals. Mm -hmm. I've got the Locals chat here as well. Welcome mm -hmm. to everybody on Locals, and welcome to everybody on oh. YouTube joining us on the YouTube mm -hmm. chat as well. Big shout out to our moderators, Alan Watson is with us Zarael. I saw Zarael in there somewhere in the uh, in the chat. Let me see if there's anybody else from the moderators to give a shout out. I don't think so, but I'm sure we'll have some more mods joining us. But uh, hello to everyone in uh, in the YouTube chat as well. Alexander, mm. we got a an interesting stream ahead of us, I think, I believe. <laughs> uh, first, yeah. <laughs> Let's let, let's let's do like just uh, 20, 30 seconds. See where people are joining us from before we uh, we get rolling. Yeah. Uh, Alexander I saw South Africa yes. joining us from South Africa. I'm seeing Sweden, um, Iran, Finland, mm. Minsk. How did how did Liz uh, Truss uh, pronounce Minsk? I think she was saying M M Minsk or something. Oh, <laughs> she, no. she, she was saying Minsk. it wrong. <laughs> I know. I know. Yeah. Anyway, we'll get into uh, that uh, as well. We, 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 will, we, will, we will get into that eventually. How many minutes? Uh, I mean, I'm not uh, quite now. New York City is with us and North Carolina is uh, with us. Mm. And uh, I'm seeing Sweden again. Amsterdam is in the house, as is Australia. Let's see. Queensland, mm. Malaysia. Awesome. That's fantastic. Canada, go truckers, go. Hello to everybody in Canada. We're going to talk about mm -hmm. Trudeau as well. Of course, this can't be a clown show mm -hmm. episode without talking about Trudeau. <laughs> Let's see. Montreal, Quebec, Melbourne, Dublin, California. Awesome. Toronto, Nuremberg, Naples, Florida, and the Philippines, and Trinidad. Awesome. Croatia. Hello to everyone in Croatia. And China, hello to everyone in China and Scotland and Colorado and Essex, UK and UAE. Alexander, hello to everyone in France. Alexander, um, let's see here. What do you want to talk about? Ice cream? You want to talk about trucks or do you want to <laughs> tackle the, uh, the fur hats? Which, uh, which one do you want the to tackle hats. first, Alexander? I mean, the fur hats was so embarrassing. I mean, I, I, as a British person, I feel utterly humiliated about it. I mean, if you, if you have any doubt now that Britain is led by clowns and that Boris Johnson isn't the only one, and bear in mind, Liz Truss has been spoken about as a possible prime minister. Well, there you've got, <laughs> there you've got the proof. I mean, she can't pronounce Minsk properly. She doesn't know whether Rostov or Voronezh are in Russia. She doesn't know that they are in Russia. Um, by the way, I, uh, on that quickly, I don't think Lavrov was asking her, was was trying to trick her. I think that was a, I think that was a, you know, rhetorical question, you know, because she was complaining about, you know, the fact that all these Russian troops are supposed to be in Russia, and he said, well, you know, what are you telling me? You know, are you telling me that you dispute the sovereignty of uh, Rostov and Voronezh, and that he must have fallen off his chair? practically or metaphorically when he said yes britain will never recognize russia's sovereignty over voronezh and Rostov." but i mean that proves a number of things firstly the incredible ignorance of the british about russia i mean you know rostov and voronezh are important big cities in russia Major i mean you know cities. it's 
It's like saying uh, so major cities. I mean, like, like saying Sheffield or Newcastle in Britain or, or uh, Hamburg and Munich in uh, Germany or Bordeaux and Lyon in France or whatever. These are big cities. But, you know, Britons and, you know, this trust passes for an educated Briton. Don't know what the big the major cities in Russia are. So that's that's one. So she's ignorant at that level. But the other thing is that she was obviously abysmally briefed. I mean, the either the Foreign Office didn't brief her properly, which tells us that the caliber of the people, the professional staff at the Foreign Office has plunged to catastrophic levels, or Liz Truss herself skipped a briefing or didn't prepare herself properly before she went to meet Lavrov. Because she's going to talk about where uh, uh, Russian troops in Russia, at the very least, she should know the, the names of the places where they are. And going into a meeting with someone like Lavrov in that kind of way is just unbelievable. And on top of all of that, you could see Lavrov's comments. I mean, he clearly felt that he was talking to a village idiot. And I'm, I'm sorry to put it in those crude terms, but I've just done uh, for my own channel a, a, part, a summary of his press conference. And I have never come across Lavrov speak as scathingly about a foreign visitor as he did about Liz Truss over the course of this uh, press conference. I mean, he, he clearly felt that, you know, he was he wasted his time with a fool. And who can deny that he's wrong? And by the way, I mean, all that parading around Moscow in a fur coat and a fur hat on a day that's warmer than London. By the way, just for parenthesis, Russians don't wear fur anywhere near as much as Westerners do, as Westerners think they do. Uh, Russians only put on fur hats and things when the weather is very cold. And of course, the weather in Moscow on that particular day was actually milder than in London. But she did that, I think, in order to remind people of Margaret Thatcher, yeah, Thatcher who yeah. back that, that in the clear. early 80s clear stunt. They visit, visited Moscow. It's yeah. a stunt. And again, of course, that offended the Russians because in the middle of what was supposed to be important diplomatic negotiations, we see Liz Truss you know, wasting her time with pointless stunts, impressing no one in Russia, annoying people in Russia. And of course, uh, um, I suspect it'll go over the heads of most people in Britain. But anyway, that was Liz Truss. As a British person, I feel humiliated, deeply embarrassed that we have a foreign secretary of this quality. I mean, I can remember days when Britain had, you know, serious people running its foreign office, people like uh, Lord Carrington, uh, uh, Pym, Douglas Hurd. You might not like them, you might not agree with them, but they were serious people. And of course, if you go back further in time, you know, there were times when Britain had exceptional diplomats, people like Castlereagh, Canning, Palmerston, a repulsive man, but none doubt a very capable foreign secretary in a technical sense, and certainly one who was very well informed about European affairs. And of course, there was Sir Edward Grey, the man who famously said, you know, that the lights are going out across Europe when the First World War began. So we've had a great tradition of diplomacy, and now we are represented by a clown. If there is any doubt at all that Britain is disastrously badly led at this critically important time, well, Liz Truss has put all those doubts to sleep. Yeah, I mean, she was she was walking around Red Square taking photos, and it was so clearly staged. I mean, the whole thing was just so bad. It was so bad. And did you see the video where um, she was like speaking to Lavrov, mm -hmm. and the translator was trying to translate, and she she didn't know how to pause she her words, and everything was getting getting jumbled up. And even Lavrov was sitting across from her, going, "Whoa." Uh, Liz, just slow down a little for the translator to catch up to what you're saying. I mean, the whole thing was such an utter train wreck. Train wreck, absolutely. I mean, I've never seen anything like it. All I could say about it, what I have to say uh, about it, is that I do wonder, I do ask this question, because, I mean, 
I knew it was going to be a train wreck, perhaps not quite on this scale, but I knew it was going to be a train wreck before it happened. Um, you knew there was going to be a train wreck. The Duran knew it was a train wreck. Why did Lavrov, one of the busiest foreign ministers in the world, waste his time with this imbecile? I mean, I can't imagine. And as you said, I mean, she can't keep the uh, 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 she can't keep pace with the interpreter. So she has a great discourtesy, by the way, to you know the, the staff who have to work really hard to keep up with diplomatic negotiations. And remember that the interpreters are also responsible for the minutes of these meetings. I mean, they're, they're supposed to keep, the, you know, they, they prepare the official yeah. record. Obviously, if you're talking to the Russian foreign ministry, there's going to be a recording as well somewhere because everything's recorded nowadays and we all know that it is. But the official record, the official stenographic record is the one that the interpreters make. So you have to understand that. You have to respect that. And you've got to give them time. And of course, Liz Truss doesn't understand that. She just plows on. I do ask myself what, as I said, the professionals in the foreign office have made of all of this. I, I would have thought they would be totally humiliated. They would feel as angry and as upset as I do, except, of course, because I'm a step removed from it. I can also see the comedic side, but, but I can't imagine that they yeah. do. I mean, it's like sending someone from a Monty Python sketch to represent Britain in international negotiations. You know, the Ministry of Funny Walks or something like that. Great <laughs> tweet of the year. Well, we all know those sketches. But I mean, it, it was it was on that level. I mean, and, and as I said, Lavrov, I could guarantee it in all his enormous time experience as Russia's foreign minister. He's been Russia's foreign minister since 2004. He can't have experienced before anything quite like this. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, f first of all, this wasn't her first uh, mess up with geography. No. Um, just last week during a BBC interview, she confused the Baltic Seas with the Black Sea. I mean, yeah. so obviously yeah. someone has to sit down with her and teach her yes. geography. I mean, yes. And that's not a joke either. Someone needs no. to sit down with her and say, this is Europe. This is the Black Sea. <laughs> this is the Baltic Sea. These are the cities in Russia. These are the cities in Germany. These are the cities in France. These are the cities in the UK. I mean, I don't know. Does she know yeah. the cities in the in the UK as well? Well, who one does wonder. Knows? But who knows? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I wonder. Someone has to brief her on this stuff. Yeah. And that's and I'm not saying that as as a joke. I mean, if she's going to be foreign minister, she better know her uh, her geography. Mm -hmm. And on your point as to why Lavrov uh, saw her, I think it was really, really good that he yeah. met with her because he exposed what a freaking joke this yeah. entire Russia is going to invade Ukraine yeah. thing yes. is. Yeah. It is a Absolutely. freaking joke. It's a train wreck, Absolutely. but it's a dangerous joke. It's a dangerous game that they're playing. Yeah. And uh, Lavrov in his speech hinted at that. I mean, he's very yeah. good with words. And he said um, yeah. something along the lines of, you know, you've been saying that we don't want to invade Ukraine because there's ice right now and we're not going to invade when when the terrain is icy this is but but he said this is like this is like uh how we're, how we're speaking to each other well it's absolutely. like there, there, there's ice there and we just can't uh we can't speak to each other i mean i mean it hints to the fact that lavrov and, and his team are well aware of the uh ridiculous narrative that's coming out from uh, from Jen Psaki and from Liz Truss and from all yeah. these people about the invasion. Russia can't invade because there's ice. Russia oh, can't absolutely. invade because there's dirt. Russia can't invade because the grass is too high, but they're going to invade <laughs> tomorrow. No, wait, they're going to invade in two weeks. Or Jake Sullivan says yeah. they're going to invade any day now. We don't know when. Absolutely. They just need yeah. two weeks to flatten the curve. Once the curve is flattened, then they're going to invade. The whole thing is an utter freaking joke. It is an absolute joke. I mean, the other the other point he made, which I thought was an extremely telling one, he actually made two, which I thought were very telling. He said the other thing is, we're not threatening anyone. We've not made any threats. They've not made any threats to invade Ukraine. The only threats are being made against us. I mean, she comes along, talks to him about sanctions and massive sanctions and dire consequences. These are threats. Russia isn't threatening to, to invade anybody. And yet it is at the receiving end of all of, of, all of those threats. And um, Liz Truss and all the Western officials say, well, Russia doesn't have anything to fear from NATO. It isn't being threatened. 
Well, it clearly does, because it is being threatened, even as we speak. That was, I thought, one very good point that um, 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 Lavrov made. I thought he made another very powerful point, actually, because, of course, she was talking endlessly about Russian troops needing to go back to their barracks. And he said, well, when Russian troops complete their exercises, they always go back to barracks. The same cannot be said for yours. And of course, you've got troops all over the world. We have our troops in Russia. And I thought that was, again, a well-made point. But I have to say, whether you need it to have Liz Trust there in order to uh, um, you know, make all of those points, I don't know. I'm going to make a rather more uh, um, calculated um, thing, because, of course, the Russians can be extremely uh, they can they, they do think these things through i think they knew in advance i'm sure they knew in advance the kind of person that the kind of things liz trust was going to say i don't think they expected it to have this comedic value i mean that you know that it was going to collapse into total farce but i think that they did know that she would be as awful in some respects as she turned out to be and i think the intention was more than anything else, to educate the Russian people. Never forget that there's always a Russian audience that Russian leaders have to take into account to educate the Russian people into how ignorant and arrogant and all over the place their Western, their Western adversaries are. They don't even know that Voronezh and Rostov are in Russia. They've never obviously even heard of those places. They come up with all kinds of ludic ludicrous comments. They interrupt interpreters. They uh, um, um, are, haven't read the Minsk Agreement. They haven't read. They, they, they don't listen to what is said to them. And I think that, as I said, this is all over the media in Russia, and I'm sure it's cutting through. Yeah. Big leadership problems, by the way. I'm going to plug a video that we're going to have up most likely tomorrow with uh, with Robert Barnes as well. And uh, mm -hmm. I will have that up tomorrow. In that video, um, Alexander and Robert, I mean, they really yeah. get into what's going on, not only with Russia, Ukraine. They talk about Putin. They talk about the mandates. They talk a lot about yeah. Canada and Trudeau. But one of the main yeah. themes of that video is uh, why we have the leaders we have in the West yeah. and uh, how this this has really unfolded, you know, over the past, you know, 20, 30 years yeah. that we're stuck with these types of leaders on all yeah. levels, whether it's, it's levels. in the bureaucracy or whether it's at yeah. the, in, in the top position. And mm -hmm. uh, you guys really uh, give a very, very good explanation as to how mm -hmm. we ended ended up like this. And you even get into some of the history with the UK and uh, mm. and how the UK is is led by such bad people. Anyway, I just wanted to give a plug out for that video. It will be yeah. up tomorrow, and it'll be yes. on locals. It'll be on uh, Rumble, BitChute, Odyssey, Super U, and we'll put as much as we can on YouTube. Mm. But because we get into a lot of the the mandates and uh, and the jabs and stuff like this, probably all of it won't be on YouTube. But keep an eye out for that video on our other uh, platforms. So that's a plug for that, Alexander. And, um, you know, before we get to uh, ice cream and <laughs> trucks, mm. uh, I just want to, I, I want you to just give me your thoughts very, very quickly mm. on uh, Camila Valieva, the, uh, the figure skater, the fantastic figure skater. And mm. we have the news about... Mm. Um, the, the sham, I think it is a complete setup and sham yeah. with uh, with this drug test that she took in December. Yeah. And uh, it was for, for a heart medicine, a very light medicine. And it took them all the way up until February, a laboratory mm -hmm. in Sweden, to mm -hmm. come back and say, oh, well, now it's positive. This is after she has tested from uh, January to February in the European uh, competitions and in the, in the run up to Beijing. She's tested negative on everything. And yeah. now they set her up with this is a 15 year old uh, uh, yes, girl. Um, she's a skating yeah. phenomenon, probably the best we've yes. ever seen in, in our life. Yes. But um, the reason I bring this up is number one, it's it's terrible what they're doing to her. Yeah. Uh, there's U.S. lawmakers who are saying they're going to to look to prosecute her. Oh no, just crazy stuff. But more than that, I think it just highlights that what we're seeing is just a full spectrum war against uh, Russia. And I say the word war. Yeah. It, it is. I mean, on all levels, economic sanctions, 
sport um, and, yeah. you know, the game that Biden is playing, it could actually turn into a hot war as well. But anyway, real quick, what are your thoughts on no, that? I, I, I'm, I, I'm extremely I, I, dis- It really bothered me what they I, did I, to this girl. I, and it is I, a I, complete setup. Once again, real quick, yeah. uh, Novichok lab in, what was it, Germany or somewhere? Yeah. Lab in Sweden. Whether you're dealing with Assange or Valievo yeah. or the Scripples, it is the same freaking story over and over and over again. I, I, I would add, and I don't remember exactly which incident it was, but I clearly remember that one of the Novichok, one of the labs that confirmed Novichok, whether it was for the Skripals or whether it was for Navalny or wherever, was located in Sweden. Whether it's the same lab, of course, as this one, I don't think so. But I mean, it's, uh, I mean, you know, just, just mentioning, since you mentioned particular countries. But no, I, I, I agree. I mean, this is a to, to say that this thing is deeply suspicious is an understatement. As I said, she's been tested, as you said, many times in many places. There's been, and even the British media, which is hardly sympathetic to Russia, have been asking, well, why? Why has this result come only through now? After all this time, on the day after she wins the gold medal. I mean, why Why wait? But, you know, I think the Russians need to be alive to this. This is this pressure on them is going to go on relentlessly. And I don't really see it ending anytime soon. And it's going to go on in international competitions, in sporting competitions. It, there's constant business pressure on them. Um, there's pressure on them all the time. And it will just go on. And I think Russians at least, need to understand that they are actually facing this siege. And I'm sure they do at some level. But this particular incident, as you said, targeting a 15-year-old girl is particularly ho- is particularly horrible. Yeah. All right. Let's, uh, let's move on, Alexander. Yeah. Take your pick. Trucks or ice cream? Ice cream refers well, to Biden, who had who had, a ter- once again, a terrible week. Uh, we got the inflation numbers. <laughs> no, no. Um, of course, Biden, once again, in his speech was a complete train wreck. And uh, his speech was no. basically, everybody calm down. Inflation is not a bad thing. Everything yeah, will no. be all right. And then, of course, you yeah. have the the king of the clown show, uh, yeah. Mr. Trudeau in Canada, who had a terrible, terrible week. He gave terrible speeches. He's doubling down on the racism no. and the white S and all of this stuff. I mean, yeah, he, it, it's it, watching him. We're watching him implode in real time. Anyway, I, 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 I agree with that. And I will just talk about Trudeau because obviously what he's been doing with the truckers hasn't worked. It's just antagonized the truckers. We're starting to see uh, um, um, opposition starting to emerge within his own liberal party. His liberal party is starting to crack. And perhaps more importantly now, the international media is beginning to criticise him. I'm reading more and more articles critical of him in the Daily Telegraph, British newspaper, admittedly, conservative newspaper. But, you know, they're coming out and talking quite openly against uh, uh, Trudeau. There's been attacks on him from uh, in the Washington Examiner, which is, you know, a rhino publication in the United States, but pretty mainstream. I, I, I think there is a genuine sense that he's just completely lost it and that he is in his last days. And I, I'm not obviously in Canada. Canadians might want to tell me otherwise. But a leader who has up to now been beyond criticism is so, suddenly coming in for criticism. And he's brought it on himself, as I said. All he needed, what he needed to do, said this right from the beginning. I saw some other people, by the way, uh, in the British media have pointed this out. Why didn't he talk to these people? Why didn't he just go out and meet them? Why didn't he say, look, I understand your concerns. I don't agree with you, but I understand your concerns. Let's sit together as Canadians and see whether we can come up with some kind of understanding. I mean, 90% of you have taken this thing apparently that's the uh, more higher proportion than the canadian population so you know i understand that there's more things that you're not getting angry with and um, troubled by let's see whether we can come up with some kind of sensible way forward that will address your problems in the future 
But of course, he didn't. He came out with all this really hideous abuse. He made all this these awful threats, and it's backfiring on him, and it's losing him support internationally. And we see that in the United States itself, which is, of course, a key country, well, now not only is money pouring in to support the truckers, but we see that some state governments are starting to take action as well, and they're thinking of bringing lawsuits against the company that basically tried to steal uh, uh, the truckers' money, the donations. Oh, okay. the, exactly. The, 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 the. So, I mean, you know, it, this is a train wreck. Uh, it, it shows his arrogance, the extent to which he's out of touch, um, his contempt for the Canadian people, or at least any part of the Canadian people that doesn't support him. And it, 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 it's a disaster. And his own performance, he's hiding away in a bunker, is just, is just ludicrous. I mean, you know, again, I can remember leaders. I mean, we talked about Lukashenko going out to meet the striking... Uh, or at least the, the, the work, they weren't striking, but the workers in the factory in Belarus during the protests. But also, I mean, I can also remember Margaret Thatcher when there was a bomb in the hotel in Brighton. Uh, the IRA planted a bomb. And within, within hours, she was out talking to people. And, you know, she was there. She was visible. There's the famous story of de Gaulle, you know, being attacked by the OAS, the... Uh, uh, a French uh, group that was angry over his, as they saw it, betrayal over Algeria, and they machine gunned his entourage and car, and he escaped with his life just by fractions of seconds, and he gets out of his car, and within a few minutes, he's fully in control, he's leading France, he's making decisions, and um, he projects the appearance of leadership. Well, I don't expect anything like that from Trudeau, from any leader. I mean, that's exceptional leadership from someone like de Gaulle. But Trudeau is running away and hiding from people who are not threatening him. I mean, it, 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 it's the most terrible, the most terrible uh, uh, imagery that I can imagine. I mean... Uh, I, I don't know what it was intended to show, whether it was intended perhaps to make it look as if these truckers were dangerous, which they manifestly aren't, or whether he's just physically scared, which if he is, then that really begs lots of questions about him. But whatever, I think it's made a disastrous impression. And I think that it must have lost him support even amongst people who have supported him up to now. At least in any rational world, it should. No, I think it's a combination of all those things that you said, but yeah. I, I believe that the his PR team, these yeah. uh, these script writers, the narrative from the beginning yeah. was, look, this is what we're going to do. Um, Trudeau, you're going to go, uh, you're not going to, you're not going to deal with this. You're not going to address this. What no. we're going to do is we're going to uh, draft a statement and we're going to call these yeah. people the R word and the white yeah. S word. We'll plant a couple of people in the uh, in the gatherings as well with with a yeah. flag here and there. We'll sprinkle a couple of flags to yeah. uh, to support your story, and yeah. that's going to be how you're going to handle it. The minute you go out there and you say that these people are bad and and this is uh, an occupation and an insurrection, the Canadian people are going to rally behind you, mm -hmm. and uh, these people will be demonized, and you're going to come out the hero. I, I really think his script writers. You know, this is this is what they wanted to to put out there, and they've probably thought that this would work. And Trudeau, yeah. who I I believe is a firm believer in the uh, neoliberal woke dogma, I think he also believed it. I also well, he, think that, like you said, Trudeau is scared to talk to them. So I think there's yeah. an element of that. He's scared to talk to them, and I don't think he has the authority to really uh, oh, uh, negotiate true. with them because at the end of the day, his orders are. Uh, passports mandates digital ids don't go back on that that is your order that is your tra tra uh, trajectory this is the direction we're moving towards oh, well absolutely well can i just point out on the second even if you don't agree with that a, a, a strong leader who may know that people will disagree with them 
uh, 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 and is prepared to be heckled, nonetheless goes out and talks to people. Lukashenko was under a lot of pressure when that, you know, during the protests, and he knew, he must have known that he would be heckled if he went to see the uh, factory workers, and yet he did that. And the some of them did heckle him, and maybe others didn't agree with him, but they all respected him because they recognized his courage, and they took, they respected the fact that he'd come out to speak to them, and he won them over in the end. Now, you know, Trudeau could have done that too. The fact that he didn't, yes, he might have got abysmally bad advice from his PR team, but he clearly agreed with the advice, and that shows bad leadership. Now, on those previous occasions that I talked about, when Ma Margaret Thatcher came out of the Brighton Hotel after the bomb, when uh, uh, de Gaulle came out of his car, his Citroën car with his bullet holes and immediately assumed control. Well, those leaders didn't need to consult anybody. They just did it because they were leaders. And that's what leaders are for. Ma uh, uh, um, Trudeau consults and works with his PR team comes up with all this manipulative behavior. And I, I agree with you about the fact. Right? I mean, I have no doubt that this planting of flags was arranged. I mean, it's very much consistent with the manipulative nature of Trudeau's politics. But what it shows you is that fundamentally, this man has no leadership skills. He's utterly unfit to run a country. He consults, he, he follows advice, which is the man, most manipulative and worse advice. He hides from his people and he abuses them. Yeah. You, you know what else Liz Truss mm. shows us about mm. governments in the West and specifically about, say, Trudeau's government as well, is that these people that are in leadership positions today in the government, whether you're looking at Liz Truss, whether you're looking at Trudeau, whether you are looking at the people that are consulting and advising Trudeau, they're idiots. Yeah. They're really not smart people. And, and I, would, I would put money on it that Trudeau has a lot of people around him who have no idea how supply chains work, how important truckers are to the economy, how important the workers are to the economy. And I really believe that they said, there were people around him that said, ah, truckers, so what? Not a big yeah. deal. Don't worry about it, Justin. Yeah. Everything will be all right. Truckers aren't that important. We'll be fine. I, I don't think anyone asked him, well, you know, how do you get all your all your food, food on the shelves? I'm sure there's people in the government who are like, I don't know. It just kind of magically appears, I guess. Yeah, I mean, yeah. these people are dumb. And Liz Trust in Moscow showed yeah. us that these people don't even know basic freaking geography. I, I absolutely agree with that. I, I think that's entirely right. In fact, I've been saying it for a long time. The problem is that we are led by fools. I mean, we are absolutely led by fools. You can see this in the discussions about sanctions, the sanctions on Russia. The people who are talking about these sanctions are obviously clueless about the true nature of the Russian economy. I mean, that it's it's disturbing how ignorant about it they are. But it's even more disturbing how ignorant they are about their own economy. And, you know, talking about sanctions at a time of supply chain disruptions and energy shortages is just, it's so ludicrous. Uh, only a complete idiot could even discuss it. And that's, of course, exactly what we've got. And with Trudeau and the truckers, him not understanding what these people do and why they matter. You are absolutely right, because, of course, once upon a time, leaders of the left who were very often, I mean, you know, drawn from the working class themselves. I mean, I remember in Britain, the Labour Party, most Labour MPs were working class people who, you know, driven trucks, worked down mines, worked in factories, worked as you know, trade unionists or shop stewards. And it, they understood that kind of thing. But these people we have today, the Trudeaus, the, the Liz Trusses, those sort of people, well, they spend all their time with each other. They have absolutely no understanding 
of the wider world. They don't understand the mechanics of how things work. They've never run their own businesses properly. <laughs> They've never had to negotiate with suppliers, think about customers, uh, uh, worry about costs. They've never had to do any of those things. Yeah. And uh, just out of final note before we get to uh, to Biden, the, mm -hmm. the ice cream loving Biden, mm -hmm. I I'm telling you, for, uh, for all the uh, hype that Klaus Schwab's uh, young leaders school gets, <laughs> boy, do they graduate idiots. <laughs> I mean, really, Klaus, if you're watching this, you really got to be beef up your, uh, <laughs> your program because, man, yeah. you are graduating some real fools. Maybe that's the point. Maybe that's the goal of it. Anyway, I mean, <laughs> it is. You know, got Maybe protests now happening in New Zealand now as well. Another graduate Absolutely. from Klaus Schwab's uh, school, and and, school. and she's school. also coming out. Arden is also saying, "Ah, no big deal, no big deal, everybody. Everything's fine. These people are the yeah. R word, and they're this word. Say copy know. paste. Same exact I thing. It, it, it's I incredible. Know. I know, and they're they're presumably the people who are also writing the. President Biden, <laughs> President Biden, Biden's talking points and, you know, preparing him for it. I mean, I, I, I have to say, again, every one of Biden's appearances becomes ever more surreal in some respects. I'm just going to make what before I discuss what Biden and about Biden, I just want to say two, uh, one thing. Two big events took place um, over the last seven days since we did our live stream, our, our previous live stream. One was the meeting between Xi Jinping and Putin in China. And it's now increasingly clear that the joint statement that was published was intended as a sort of coming out document. It's the Chinese and the Russians providing their political manifesto now to the world, saying we are indeed Team Russia, China. This is what we're about. This is what we're going to do. And this is the way we're going to work forward. So that was a big event last week. But the other big event is the inflation readout in the United States. Seven and a half percent. And we have the president of the United States. All is well. <laughs> there is no cause for concern. We're going from strength to strength. Our economy is booming. Obviously, I'm being parodic but i mean that was the impression and of course if you don't agree well that must mean that you're a sort of bad so and so you must you know the r word and the w word and you must be a republican and you must be trying to plot and subvert our great economy i mean it, it was it was very i mean obviously as i said i'm being parodic but that was almost the impression i got listening to it all and you know i i i have to say i i almost wanted to ask him, you know, if seven and a half percent inflation is so wonderful, why not? Why not have more? Why not have 15 percent inflation or 30 percent? 50, inflation, 50, 100 or 50 or 100 percent inflation. I mean, you know, it, it, it was it was it was weird. It was absolutely surreal. And does he understand the pressure people are under across the United States? Does he understand what inflation is? that it actually means that people's incomes, real incomes are falling, that people are struggling to pay their bills. And does he understand that everything that he is doing from the way in which his economic policy is being run to his talk about sanctions against the world's biggest energy and food exporter <laughs> is going to make that inflation those problems that those Americans are suffering from, that's going to make those worse? Well, the answer is, of course, he doesn't. He doesn't understand anything because he's this amiable, only he's not actually so amiable because we see what he thinks of other people. But he's, he's a nasty this, guy. He's, he's, he's a nasty. exactly, exactly. He's this, he, anyway, he projects this image of this amiable, doddery grandfather figure. And of course, he's got all of these points read out for him because again he spent all his life essentially as a politician and as a lobbyist for various powerful uh, groups he doesn't really understand what it's like to have the bill the you know your, your, your energy bill your food bills other bills coming through the door um your in your mortgage your mortgage interest payments 
uh, rise. He doesn't understand what that means for people in America. And he was a mediocre politician at that. 50 years well, as a mediocre absolutely. politician. Yeah. Well, absolutely. And, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's exactly what he was. Even, even, even copying Neil Kinnock for God's sake. I mean, yeah. it was speech to Neil Kinnock, mate. I mean, you know, I mean, you know, if you want to borrow uh, phrases, you know, at least go to the good ones. I mean, you know, win, you know take it from Winston Churchill or Shakespeare <laughs> or something like that. Shakespeare. <laughs> I mean, you know, Neil Kinnock, a person I'm sure most Americans watching this program I have no idea who that is but he was a he was the leader of the labor party in the 1980s who lost lost every election <laughs> he, yeah. he led the labor party in against margaret thatcher so he was a failed labor leader and and that's the man who speeches uh, uh joe biden at one point during during his uh, one of his own presidential bids that was the man who joe biden decided to plagiarize yeah you know what's really weird about Biden, real comical, I would say, mm. about Biden, and I never expected mm. it. I never expected his team wow. to be that dumb, but I no. guess they are, is when he was campaigning, there were two issues that were uh, eating away at him. Yeah. Both him, his family, um, mm. you know, the yeah. two, two big issues when he was campaigning, yeah. Ukraine yeah, and crack, Hunter, Hunter and crack, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> two issues. The one issue, Hunter. Hunter was, yeah. they, they covered it up and we all know the story, big tech and, and all of that yeah. stuff. So they buried the laptop and, and people yeah. didn't really get to see what was going on until after, um, right. after the vote. And then you had Ukraine, which yeah. was a huge scandal, Burisma and Hunter and, yeah. and, and Biden going over there and firing the guy who, who he was going to give, uh, what was the name? Shokin, the prosecutor yeah. and- you know, son of a bee, you know, he got fired and, and, and all of that stuff going on in Ukraine. Those were the two things that were eating away at uh, the Biden campaign. His first year in presidency, what does he do? Mm. <laughs> all he deals with is Ukraine. Yeah. And he puts uh, some legislation forward to uh, to give crack to uh, to addicts. <laughs> I mean, it's just um, there's no self-awareness whatsoever no, 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 in, on, no. on his team at all. No. No, none at all. None whatsoever. But as th this is a surreal presidency. I mean, uh, um, Robert Barnes in that program that you mentioned that you gave a plug for, which is a program everybody should watch. Uh, I mean, he talked about this, the f that this is the most chaotic administration he has ever seen. And of course, he's followed American politics as an American in America for as long as anybody around, I, su I suspect. Yeah. We're going to get to uh, locals questions and super chats, Alexander, but you said there were two big things that happened last week. Yeah. I would say there's a third big thing that no one yeah. is really talking about. Mm. And uh, maybe you can uh, just uh, elaborate on it a bit. Um, South America and Latin America starting to uh, explore their options. Yeah. One Belt, One Road, yeah. uh, China and, yeah. uh, and this other uh, part yeah. of the world which I think is really fascinating. Um, the big news, Argentina, of course, and yeah. they're looking at doing more partnerships with China. Mm. Obviously, we had the president uh, in, yeah. uh, in Russia as well. I know there's other countries in Central and South America that yes. are also either moving ahead or yes. exploring possible yes. cooperations with, um, with uh, China and, and Russia. And let's say the other, uh, the other uh pole of this multi multipolar world. Yes. Uh, what do you think of that? I think that's huge news, especially for the United States. That once again, the, the mainstream media just doesn't talk no, about it. No, they don't. They 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 just don't get it. Because now I think that is a huge story, but it is in effect part a part of that first story about the emergence of Team Russia China. Because what's happening is this: the Chinese now know that they have the Russians at their back. Now, why is that important? China is vulnerable to cutoffs of supplies of raw materials. If the US were to try and choke China by, say, blockading the Straits of Malacca, it'd be difficult for China to get um, oil, food, all these things that China imports. Now, she's, China has Russia at her back, and China, Russia can supply all these things. It can supply China with gas 
it could supply Russia with oil, China with oil. Iran, the Iranian ambassador to China, has not come out also. And so that Iran will also be supplying China with oil. So Iran, China, sorry, is moving quickly to end its vulnerabilities. That's what Team Russia-China is all about. That's what the Greater Eurasia Partnership is all about. And with their vulnerabilities being solved, they are going global. They're going to places like Latin America. And the Latin Americans who understand this very well and who have been, some of them have been chafing about the, you know, their, the fact that they've been having to follow the U.S., but also who are looking at US, today's U.S., and are saying, is this the country that we actually want to follow? Well, they're now starting to look at the alternative. They realize that this China, this, the China with the Belt and Road is here to stay. It's quite possibly the future country. It's addressing its vulnerabilities. It's forged these links with Russia. It's got good links with Iran now. It's no longer vulnerable in the way that it was until a couple of years ago. And this is the stronger power, the stronger pole. It's clearly led. It's decisively led. So let's start to tilt towards it. And unless Americans get their act together, more and more countries around the world are going to start to do this. Of course, Latin America is particularly sensitive to the U.S., because, of course, it's part of the, you know, the, the Western Hemisphere. But, of course, you see this in Africa also. When Blinken did a tour of Africa some months ago, he found that in every African country, the Chinese were there ahead of him. And on every single African country he visited, he found that the African leaders that he spoke to made it clear that they still wanted to maintain and build their relations with China. And of course, in the Far East and the Asia Pacific region, we had the disastrous idea of sending Kamala Harris around to try and talk the Far East Asians around with a disastrous trip by Kamala Harris to Vietnam. So it, it, it shows you China's global reach. And as I said, as you rightly said, as you absolutely rightly said, people in the United States the leadership there are just not aware of it. They, they, they are not addressing this issue. They're bogged down, worrying about a fictional invasion of Ukraine, a country which, to be very clear, is of peripheral importance to the US. It's an economic and financial drain. That's all it is now. And at the same time as that's happening, they see the Chinese and the Russians starting to build links in Argentina, in Brazil. Bolsonaro is going to Moscow, apparently. All of these things are now taking place around them. Yeah, there's a, actually, I think there's an announcement that came out yesterday that uh, Biden's going to be sending Kamala Harris to Germany in order to deal with uh, the Russia, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. That's, that's not a joke either. I mean, she's no, going to finally get to go to Europe. <laughs> Kamala I mean, in Europe dealing with Kamala in Europe. This. Well, I know. Well, quite. Oh, I mean, the Germans God. must be. I mean, you know, she's obviously the the right person to send. Oh, <laughs> I mean, the send. borders are. She is the borders are. She is the borders are. are. She she is the borders are. are. Absolutely. So she knows all about these things. I mean, you know, right? You could send Groucho Marx, and it might actually achieve more. But you, you don't have him because he's dead. You submit. You send Kamala Harris instead. Boy, oh boy, we're going to have a lot of material next week if I that know. is the case. I know. <laughs> anyway. I know. Uh, let's get to some questions, uh, Alexander. I'll be going into uh, locals. I'll go into the super chats, mm. of course, and I'll go into uh, the uh, the YouTube chat as well. And I'll just yeah. pull out all kinds of questions. But let's start with some questions from uh, one question from last week, which came to us right yeah. when we ended the stream, Alexander. But I saved that question. It was from Raphael. And uh, Raphael said, the State Department is gushing in the U.S. media how it was a joint operation with Russia in the killing of the IS." uh guy I, that is true there was a joint yeah. operation i think that's confirmed yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, what, what, what actually happened was the Russians didn't play any direct military role, but there clearly was some kind of intelligence swap. And when the Americans said they were going in, the, the Russians agreed to stay out of the way. But here again, a good place to see a discussion of this is in our program with Robert Barnes. Because as Robert Barnes pointed out, the actual operation itself, well, it did kill the man. It was targeted at whether the original plan was to kill him or not isn't clear. But the operation itself was botched. <laughs> Women and children were killed. All sorts of things were messed up. It didn't go terribly well in itself. And um, he, the point is that this administration can't even do those kind of things effectively. But yes, at an intelligence level, at a level of intelligence information, intelligence swapping, the Russians and the Americans do maintain some kind of contacts with each other and always will do. They did throughout the Cold War, for example. And even if things re turn really, really bad, they will continue to do so at some levels. By the way, I've seen it done. I was actually at a reception it was years ago. My father took me to uh, on a recept to a reception in the embassy, the Russian embassy in Athens, and there was all the U.S. military attaches sitting huddled and talking to the Russian military attaches, and it was obvious that they were swapping information, and the they were swapping information about at that time about uh, Bosnia and about you know possible things that were going on there, and so I mean I've I've seen it done, and I've seen I've seen how it's done. All right. Uh, Mark Hewitt says, upon hearing the Rostov Varonish question, why didn't the British ambassador step in before, not after Liz Truss made a fool of herself? Well, I suspect that the uh, ambassador couldn't believe <laughs> that the foreign secretary would make such a complete fool of herself. I mean, probably, uh, I mean, that was a mistake. Perhaps she should have realized by that point what a completely crass and incompetent, incompetent foreign secretary, uh, she was. She was, but I can't. I, I, I suspect the ambassador couldn't quite believe, couldn't credit that Liz Truss would be so disastrously poorly briefed, or perhaps not briefed at all, before she came to Moscow and came up against Lavrov and came up with comments like that. Yeah. Hunger says no one here likes Macron, but if he can broker a comprehensive deal with Russia and revitalize French nuclear energy, he'd have left his mark on Europe. But I agree with yes. that. Macron is, uh, uh, he's the guy now. He's the guy. I, I, I absolutely agree with that. And I mean, it's, it speaks an awful lot about the caliber of leadership today that um, Macron looks like, you know, the leader, the, 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 the one person. I, the, the fact is, he's got two brain cells to rub together. The others have none. <laughs> I mean, just just look at what we've been yeah. talking about. When you when you when you're up when you when you're when the other people you have to deal with are Liz Truss, Justin Trudeau, and President Biden. Well, it's not difficult to look like a genius. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's. <laughs> Well, you got to hand it to him. I mean, he, he yeah, sees, yeah. you know, who, who he's dealing with. And he says, this is an easy one. This is an easy W for me. I mean, Absolutely. Absolutely. He is aware of well, that. that that's the, one thing, the, one, the one thing he understands, it seems to me, is that there isn't going to be a Russian invasion of Ukraine. <laughs> so he can do lots of grand diplomacy. And whatever happens... Whether, you know, all these ideas that he's coming up with are accepted. I su suspect some of them will be in the end, by the way, because I think the Germans will be quite interested in them eventually. But, you know, whether they succeed or not, he could always come along and say, I'm the person who prevented war in Europe. The Americans and the British have been talking about war in Europe. But I went to Moscow. I talked with my friend Vladimir Putin and I prevented it. So, you know, but actually... His ambitions clearly go much further than that. And he clearly does want a new security architecture for Europe. He clearly does think that the Russians have been deceived and badly treated in the past. Talked about mistakes. He spoke of Russia as a friend. And of course, he clearly also thinks that Ukraine is a complete mess and should be solved in some way, even though it's incredibly difficult to do. 
and um, you had to read his press conference and pass it very carefully to see that he could see those things. And all credit to him for doing so. Yeah. I will say this, though. I do believe that uh, a false flag flag is being prepared um, by the Biden administration. The only thing I just don't don't know how to answer, because we're getting this question a lot, um, is what that false flag is going to be no. and if it will work to uh, force Putin's hand to uh, to take action against Ukraine. I, I, I don't know. I can't answer that question. There's there's no doubt that Zelensky does not want to act on uh, no. on this. He doesn't want to. Uh, to start this false flag, but it doesn't mean that someone else in Kiev won't do it. But Pre I really precise. believe something is going to happen. Yeah, I agree. We're going to have to wait and see how Russia reacts to it. Yes, oh, there's that. that there's that famous expression: if you bring a, lo a loaded gun uh, 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 to a, to a party, this is with Chekhov. Then before the party's ended, that loaded gun will have been fired. And uh, there's been lots. I mean, the very fact that people are talking about false flags, note it was the Americans who did so. Yeah. means that something is coming, um, or at least something has been hatched. Zelensky clearly isn't keen. The Ukrainians around him aren't keen, but Zelensky and his officials are not everyone in Ukraine, and there are some very, very violent and dangerous people there. Yeah. The big hint for me that this is a definite thing, the false mm -hmm. flag, 99% is going to happen, was McConnell. Yeah. McConnell's statement that Schultz yeah. said he's going to cancel Nord Stream 2 if Russia invades Ukraine. When Schultz did not make any such comment in public at all. No, exactly. And uh, exactly. McConnell just threw him under the bus. And to yep. me, that hints that the Americans are just saying, you know what, we're going to move ahead yep. regardless yep. of what uh, the Germans say or do. Absolutely. I completely agree with that. I mean, I, I thought that was an extraordinary thing. And um, I, um, unbelievably, unbelievably disrespectful of the Germans, by the way. Because, of course, the Germans have intentionally avoided talking about Nord Stream 2 and yet McConnell comes out and, late, and, and talks about things that Olaf Scholz is supposed to have told him in private but that's unsurprising and of course if people are prepared to be disrespectful in that way well they're not going to stop at a little thing like arranging a false flag yeah all right uh raul says inflation in the u.s is officially 7.5 percent thoughts on worldwide impact since everything is priced in usd well not everything but many 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 things and you're you're absolutely right to make the point about it being officially priced at seven and a half percent i have no doubt it's actually much higher in the baltic states i understand by the way it is all it is officially in double digits you know, the countries that have been um, so vocal in this crisis with Russians, they're the ones that you are economically especially vulnerable, and they've already got double-digit inflation officially. But even in the United States, it's much higher, and it's pretty much higher pretty much everywhere than, you know, the official readouts are saying. And if inflation is high in the United States that inevitably, because of the central role of the dollar and of the US economy in the world financial and economic systems, that American inflation is going to be transmitted everywhere. It's going to affect the price of oil. It's going to affect the price of food. It's going to affect the price of every single item that is sold and traded in dollars around the world. And that, to a great extent, extent, explains why we have the inflation that we have today. Supply chain disruptions, no doubt, have played a part. But always remember that supply chain disruptions most often, and to a great extent in this case, are the product of inflation, not the cause of it. Yeah. Valies is also in the house now moderating. Welcome, Valies. Good to have you here. Mm. And thank you, Valies, for that super chat. Mm. Uh, Alexander, here, this is a three-part uh, super chat, so bear with me as I read it. And it's an interesting one. It's a good one. From uh, Sanjeva, part one of three says, I am a super supporter of Russia. Wife is uh, Russian too, but this Kamala Valieva debacle is utter incompetence and stupidity on Russia's part. There was no reason why 
trimetazidine, trimetazidine should be in a child's urine part uh, part two of three. Somebody obviously yeah. gave this to her and now her career is ruined. Russia needs to take this seriously and not be defensive about this. They need to wipe out this culture so pervasive in their sporting system. And part three of three says they should not cover this up. Russian sports people suffer because of this who would have won regardless. I'm sorry, but I am so angry about this these idiotic relics who still seem to be inside sports systems in Russia. I, 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 you, there may be some truth to this. I mean, and I'm, I'm not entirely discounting uh, uh, um, that possibility. And I mean, this is, uh, and, and can I just say that your point about the fact that there is being a culture of this kind in Russia and in Russian sports is indisputable. In this, in, in all these, superpower sports, though, uh, to I be, I, I, Russia has a big problem there. As yeah. does the U.S., as does right. China, as does the oh, U.K. No. I mean, I can name Absolutely. many athletes, high-profile athletes, um, in all of uh, these countries. Uh, uh, who, who, who absolutely, have been caught doping. Absolutely, uh, and 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 as I was say, and as we were saying at the start of this program, there is something. There are things about this particular incident that are suspicious, to say the least. I mean, that was a test that was taken in December, and it's announced in February, the day after. She wins gold. And after she's passed all sorts of other tests in all sorts of other places, it does look as if, frankly, someone held this back until after that gold was achieved. I mean, that sometimes the simplest explanations are the right ones. And that looks to me like the right one. And given the extreme tensions that we're seeing at the moment, I, I, I have to say, I'm a, I am suspicious of this, but that doesn't detract from your underlying point, because firstly, the Russians absolutely do need to clear this thing up completely. Uh, uh, whatever problems they've had in the past, whatever things going on, they have to stop now. And the second thing is they need to be incredibly careful that, um, you know, people who are tested are tested at the right laboratories that uh, checks are made. They need to protect their athletes. They need to understand that this problem is going to continue and that their country is under siege effectively. That's what they need to understand. Yeah, they need to understand yeah. that their country is going to, if, if an athlete um, from the US is test, tested once, their athletes can yeah. get tested 10 times, for example. Yes, yes. Just an example. Yes. But that's, that's what they exactly. need to understand. Absolutely. Um, but but we also have to have to state that from what I understand, from that December test onwards, she's taken many tests, including yes. the one for the Beijing Olympics, and she's come mm -hmm. out clean on all of those tests. Yes. And yes. the test that she took in December was for uh, a contest in St. Petersburg. And it was, I believe, the Russian authorities mm -hmm. who um, who noticed this test. I, I believe that's what I read. So, I mean, there's yeah. a lot of gray area here about... Yes. Um, Yes, uh, about that competition in Russia. Sorry, they're the ones that actually uh, mentioned this medicine that she was taking. So yes. th this wasn't hidden that she was taking no. this medicine, from what I understand. No. Um, once again, there's a lot of gray area here. I think the simple way to look at it is this is a test in December. Yeah, it comes out now, and up until December, she has taken many tests and was cleared to compete. So yes. something is off. Absolutely. I agree. Mm -hmm. yeah, anyway, is, yeah. anyway, but, but 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 thank you for your question, and you do make a you do make a good point. Let's never say to each other, you know, to ourselves, that Russia is perfect and doesn't do things wrong. It often does. No, the the, the Olympics in general. Just a final point: Absolutely. games uh, need to yeah. they, they need to clean up their entire policy in general. Well, I know. I mean, the, the Olympics, in my opinion, and I, I, yeah, I get to say this, I mean, I remember the Olympics as they used to be conducted. And today, they've been so taken over by the most um, corrupt practices that I think they need a fundamental makeover, makeover as yeah. well, if, they, if they're to continue at all. But, you know, let's not get sidetracked into that long discussion yeah that's a different discussion for yeah. another day perhaps uh thank you very much for that uh that super chat to sanjeva and Raphael says guys is lavrov watching the duran live now remember when i was talking about the anglo-saxons he's using it now too lol duran <laughs> is going boom <laughs> thank you very much uh, that i i well i don't think watching? 
Who, who knows? We must ask him. He does. By the way, I mean, he certainly watches or follows media. Uh, um, I, I read a, an interview he gave with some Russian journal, and he was uh, taking off articles that he'd read in all sorts of publications, national interests in the US, for example, uh, uh, foreign policy. I mean, he clearly is kept very well informed about, about what people are saying. Does he follow us? I'd love to think so. <laughs> I'm not sure at all. But on the, on the subject of the word Anglo-Saxons, the Russians use it quite a lot. A lot of people around the world use it, actually. Perhaps uh, uh, the British and the Americans don't use it that much. But in, in, in parts of continental Europe and in Russia, it's not such an unusual uh, turn of phrase. You know what I would say, just a parenthesis to that, I would hope that people in the uh, mm. in the U.S. government, in the State Department, the Pentagon watch us. Yeah. I would hope because yeah, I think I would. they would they would probably get a clearer understanding of uh, of what's going on, because there are good people there. There are very absolutely, good people in those departments. Yeah. I, yeah. Well, there are exceptional people in those departments. And can I just say, I mean, I, I saw an example of that a, a short while ago last week when I passed the American replies to the Russian demands, you know, the, these exchanges of documents and the um, US replies, you know, I'm not saying, you know, that they were right or that they were good in their substance, but they were very, very well drafted and very, very well organized and sought out. So there are some very, very capable people within the US government. And I would love to think that they do follow us, but yeah. You know, who knows? Who knows? <laughs> Raphael <laughs> says, I wonder what will happen if Lavrov asks these three questions to her, to trust, I guess. Who are you talking to? What can you do to us? And what the hell are you? This woman is crazy. This woman was crazy. How do you know that he didn't ask those questions? <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. What do you know, Raphael, that we don't? <laughs> well, well, we don't. Well, all I will say is, I mean, I, I've never come across, I've never read a press conference like like the one that uh, Lavrov and Liz Truss uh, uh, had. And um, the, the Russians, by the way, produced a transcript almost immediately. The Russian foreign ministry is often very slow in providing English language transcripts, but they uh, belted this one out, which shows that they want the world to know, <laughs> including the English-speaking world, to know what, what actually happened. And, well, I mean... He may not have used exactly your words, but essentially he said, made the very points that you're making. Yeah. Thank you, Dominique, for that super chat. And uh, two questions with regards to Canada. I believe the first one's from Robin, who says Davos tentacles are all over this. Yeah. I, I agree with, with that. Agree, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, as we've said many times, Trudeau is, is the last of the Rat Pack yeah. that's left. He's yeah. the last one left. Obama is out. Merkel is out. Uh, who else? Renzi, Cameron. Yeah. Cameron, yeah. All of those guys are out. All Trudeau is the last one standing. And Bruce Alexi says uh, he, Trudeau, should stand up and talk to the people, just like Ceausescu did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Matt Taibbi made exactly that point, by the way. he did. A, he's done a brilliant piece. But of course, he says that uh, uh, Trudeau already sounds like Ceausescu <laughs> with his comments that yeah, Trudeau's been making or, or have that sort of Ceausescuan quality. Um, the, the point about Ceausescu, of course, was that that speech was supposed to be an incredibly controlled one. If you actually watch the whole video of it, I mean, it, it was all assembled. It was all the people who were brought into the square and it was all staged with all the usual communist ceremonies and all that kind of thing. So um, that's why Ceausescu was caught by surprise. And of course, um, in a way, what Trudeau has been doing is the same because he's also staging his comments. A, a real democratic leader goes out and talks to people and accepts, acknowledges in advance that there's going to be heckling and there might be some toing and froing and things of this kind. That's what they should do. But of course, um, Trudeau won't do it, can't do it. And that's why he does risk a Ceausescu moment. Yeah. 
Renat, thank you very much. HK200, thank you very much, Renat, for yeah. that super chat. And Coach Red Pill says, I'm in Kiev now. Looking forward to talking to you guys and telling you all about it on Tuesday. Keep up the great work, CRP. Thank you very much, Coach. And we, yeah, we will do a recording on Tuesday. And uh, Coach uh, Red Pill is in Ukraine, so he's going to give us all the info as to what's going on there on the ground. So I'm looking mm -hmm. forward to, to that. Elena Diaz says, uh, interesting truckers started the coup in Chile with an action in 1972. The actual Pinochet coup, 9-11, 1973. Coincidence or irony? Irony. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't think that this is... I mean, uh, the, the coup in Chile was a very complicated affair. The United States was involved at multiple levels. The military was involved. I don't think it's going to play out in exactly that sort of way. But it is irony because, of course... Uh, it, it shows you the, how the dynamics are the same. And can I say there are resemblances between Trudeau and the Allende government. Allende was a much more, shall I say, serious person, more donish, more academic. In my opinion, he was also, in many respects, an incompetent president. Doesn't excuse some of the things that were done to him. But Trudeau is as incompetent as Allende was left-wing not academic spendthrift, not <laughs> academic not well organized and of course the, the protests in some respects do have similar causes because the truckers in Chile felt that their uh, livelihoods were coming under pressure I mean Allende's government created a massive inflation uh, well uh, they created an inflation crisis in Chile which is what was driving the protests there. And the same, of course, is true in Canada. Uh, there's an inflation crisis, a cost of living crisis. And of course, on top of that, there's this layer upon layer upon layer of increasingly confusing and difficult regulations that Emperor Trudeau imposes, burdens his people with. And just as that provoked a reaction in Chile, it's provoked a reaction in Canada. Yeah. I don't think the outcome will be the same. I don't think it will turn out in the same way. I think Ceausescu, I think Ceausescu more than Allende, if I have to be honest. Yeah, well, Ceausescu didn't, didn't turn out too well for, for Ceausescu. No, no, no. Well, I mean, I, I wouldn't want it, obviously, to end in exactly the same way in yeah. either case. I mean, both Allende and Ceausescu died. Yeah. Um, some, it's, but but I mean I wouldn't want that to happen to Trudeau. I mean I'm a peaceful man, but I certainly don't want him to stay Prime Minister of Canada. I want it to be cease to be Prime Minister of Canada. I want there to be a proper investigation into all the things that have been going on whilst he's been Prime Minister of Canada, because an awful lot of things have happened, and unless a lot of scandals, exactly, unless they're investigated properly the poison that he has left behind him will stay yeah, and right. fester and will contaminate the future politics of Canada. So I want all that to happen. And above all, I want him gone. Yeah. P people forget that uh, Trudeau has been involved in a lot of scandals from, from yeah. travel scandals to SNC Lavalin to the weed mm -hmm. charity scandal. Yeah. I mean, these things need to be properly uh, uh, looked into Examine. without exactly. a doubt. Exactly. Um, Moon over Miami says, Alex, Mitsotakis of Greece is still standing. I, I wouldn't say Mitsotakis is no, part of the original Rat Pack. No, he wasn't. I mean, the Obama, I, I should preface that it's... and say the Obama Rat Pack. Rat Pack, I can back, yeah. yeah. I mean, Tsipras was really, was very much a part of that Rat Pack, I should yeah. say. And in fact, during the uh, financial crisis. I think he got along crisis, with Obama well. Oh, he got very well along with Obama. In the financial crisis in 2015, Obama telephoned Merkel and that was when they came to this compromise over, you know, it wasn't even a compromise, this idea that Greece would get the, the next bailout and would remain in the euro, which is what Tsipras also wanted. So you yeah. see, Obama and Tsipras were actually very close. Um, Tsipras and the uh, Syriza were very, very close to the Democrats in the US, as I gradually came to realise. Yeah. One thing about Ceausescu and his palace, if there's anyone watching from Romania, uh, that, that palace is massive, Alexander. 
Yeah. I mean, when you go to Bucharest and you see that palace, I think if I'm not mistaken, it is one of the largest structures in mm. uh, in uh, Europe, one of the largest like buildings, Absolutely. standalone buildings Absolutely. in Europe. Absolutely. I mean, it is, it is a sight to see how, how big and how imposing it is. Yes. But if there's I, anyone in Romania, let me know what it is, if it is the largest or one of the largest, because it's, it's absolutely huge. Yeah. Ceausescu, yeah. Um, Amrit says, Techno Alpin, an Italian firm, supplied snowmaking gun to Beijing 2022 when the media reported that this artificial snow is for the first time used in the Olympics and is bad. But the firm says it supplied it for the last six Olympics. <laughs> Propaganda. Well, there you go. You propaganda all the time, disinformation all the time. It goes on all the time. I mean, one has to accept that that's the reality of the media space. We, well, of course, aim to counter that. Well, Lavrov uh, left Liz, Liz Truss standing at the podium, right? Yeah, no, that's that. I mean, <laughs> when, if you watch the video. Video, exactly. But, I mean, in, fa in fact, he, I mean, that, 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 that didn't actually happen. Though, frankly, I mean, it, didn't, it just didn't happen. I mean, they, they finished... And he left the podium first because he was nearer the door. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't like the way it's been represented. He, he opened the, the door for her. Exactly, opened the door for her. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's exactly, he opened the door for her. I mean, that's not how the media, in, but the media in Britain, this is, by the way, a, a sign of how badly that meeting went. I mean, they've been been unbelievably abusive about Lavrov. They're brought in. They, I, I read about how he's this foul-mouthed foreign minister. This is because he once used a swear word, apparently. <sighs> But, you know, long time ago. And of course, if you know anything at all about British political culture, which is what Liz Truss is absolutely a part of, British political culture uses swear words all the time. I mean, British politicians use them continuously with each other and with their officials. Yeah. Let's see. Kurt. How are you doing, Kurt? Uh, like earlier this week where police officers broke rank, now a, ca now a Canadian major has. YouTube channel Sam the Trucker. Mm. Uh, thanks to at Scott NYC for the hint. There are people that are breaking. Yeah, absolutely. That's a oh, good absolutely, point. Yeah, absolutely. You're seeing officers. Well, you're seeing they're yeah. breaking rank. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I, I mean, the way in which the police are being used in Canada, which is more like a secret police. I mean, if you want to make comparisons in some ways he's, he's closer some some of the things they're doing are closer to Ceausescu's Securitate than they are to the Royal Canadian Mounted Police as I remember it now I I, I want to obviously make it clear when I say that that obviously we're not quite yet when well we're not anywhere close yet to the Romania of Ceausescu which as I said I, I didn't visit but many of my many people I know did and they spoke about is a very frightening place but you know we're edging in that direction i mean when money is seized when pressure is put on people behind the scenes when there's pressure put on people to steal uh, uh to prevent fuel being provided to prevent f food being provided and when and apparently this is now acknowledged there's interference in telephones i mean it, it it begins to look more like a secret police than a Terrible. real police. Mm -hmm. Police in democracies are there to, to preserve order and fight crime. Mm -hmm. They're not there to be political arms of Western governments. Yeah. Seamus says, largest palace in the world, 2.5 million square meters inside. Wow. 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 That's big. Thank you for that. Um, Let's see, J, JDJ555, thank you for your super chat. Uh, Radovid says, the West is brain dead like the ant infected by paras parasitic fungus climbing mindlessly towards the <laughs> sun. Time will show who the, who the PR. History is merciless with the incompetent. Absolutely, of course it is. And there's History that, what, is merciless uh, with the incompetent. With the incompetent, it's absolutely true. Uh, completely right. And um, in the West, we need to understand this. I mean, once upon a time, we could perhaps carry bungling and incompetent leaders. But the world is changing. And we don't have that luxury of time 
um, any longer. We need to sort out our politics very, very fast. If you want to see why that's important, read all the texts of what came out of that meeting in Beijing. Yeah. Um, Moon Dragon says Lavrov is showing to the UK and the West that their nonsense is now over and Russia is in no mood to listen. Yes, that's the big story of 2021, 2022. I mean, it's exactly, you're abs absolutely right. That's exactly what's happened. The Russians, and they're quite open about that. I mean, Lavrov even said so in during this press conference. They've said, look, we've tried diplomacy. We've tried uh, uh, to explain our position time and time and time again. We find that nobody listens. So now we've said enough and we're setting out our red lines and we're making it absolutely clear from now on that our position is so far and no further. And we are now in a position where we can do that. And what we've seen is a collective nervous breakdown across the West as they have finally confronted with the fact that the Russians have imposed these red lines. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Valley S, thank you, Valley S, for that super chat and for the membership. And thank you very much to our moderators. Another shout out to our moderators, mm -hmm. Alan, Zariel, Valley S. And uh, I think that's our, those are our moderators. Thank you very much for the work that you do, for the help that you give us. Black Tie, thank you very much for your super chat. Rainy Steps says, let's go, Justin Castro. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> really there's apparently. I mean, I mean, I don't know whether that's true or not, but apparently, there's not just people who believe it or people who've been mischievous. They say there's apparently some reason to believe it might be true. <laughs> certainly, the, well, certainly, one thing's the, for sure. There is a, there is a physical similarity. Yeah. One has to say this. Yeah, Trudeau has become the most memed prime minister now, and the most memed world leader in the world. I know. Now. I, I mean, know. he's he's overtaken Joe Biden. I never thought it would be possible, but yeah. he's done it. Yeah, yeah. Congratulations, Justin. That, that's an accomplishment. He's now more memed than uh, than Joe Biden is. Yeah. <laughs> How about that? Uh, let's see. Uh, Tawau Ho Gan, thank you very much for your super chat. And Elena Diaz says, what will it take for Germany to end the U.S. occupation and regain its sovereignty? Germany, Germany to elect a government that will say finally no. Now Germany has done that or came very close to doing that once before, not it, not in quite that way. But when uh, the Willy Brandt government appeared in the 1960s, it, it's not I think appreciated today how controversial the policy that Willy Brandt was trying to sort to follow, which is Ostpolitik, was in those days. It was controversial within Germany, and of course, it was also controversial with many people in the United States. But Willy Brandt had the political vision and the strength and the self confidence to do it, and it would require similar levels of self confidence and political strength and vision to do it in Germany today. But it could be done, there would be disruptions. There might be pressures on Germany, very, very severe pressures on Germany. But, of course, the Germans have many cards they could play themselves if they chose to do so. Maybe one day it will happen. At the moment, it can't and it won't because Germany's political class is terrible, just as the political class everywhere in Europe and in the West is terrible. I mean, Olaf Scholz may be an amiable man, a nicer man than Justin Trudeau, a less incompetent person than Liz Truss, but he's certainly no Willy Brandt. Yeah. Poland would welcome those U.S. troops from Germany. Oh, yeah. That's what Johnny says. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, and, and, you know, one day maybe the Poles will also <laughs> start to rethink their strategies. But, you know, if, if, if Germany wants to take its position, then, you know, and tells the troops to go, and the troops go to Poland, well, that shouldn't bother Germany. And Thomas says, Germany can do nothing. You have no idea how serious the decline is, like the USA. Oh, yeah. I, 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 I'm afraid that might be right. I mean, I'm hearing increasingly bad things coming out of Germany. People sense a growing sense of malaise there. 
um, it's beginning to look increasingly like Britain um, in the in the early 1970s, before there was this big dip and begin pat people began to talk for the first time about British decline. Mm-hmm. Um, where are we here? Let's see. Did it, did it, did it. Rocky Luck says, with NATO's military buildup in Romania, is it realistic that NATO will move into Moldova, confronting the Russia peacekeepers in Transnistria? That's that's a big topic. It's not impossible, but I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. Yeah. I, I, I I think that there would be, um, I, I I think that there would be serious opposition within NATO to making a move like that. Um, I think that I, I, it, it, I don't. I don't think even this administration is going to be prepared to go that far. R- Romania is really being armed to the teeth with with the NATO yeah. equipment, though, isn't it? I mean, yeah, does that absolutely. surprise you? No, it doesn't surprise me. And I mean, I think a point we ought to say is that Romania and Russia are two countries that have never had particularly good relations, even in the 19th century when they were sometimes allies, even during the First World War when they also became allies. There was always this undercurrent of tension between the two despite Romania being an orthodox country but there's always been this issue of Moldova that's got in the way Ceausescu didn't like the Russians for example I mean you know so there's always been this tension and there's this antagonism between the two countries so uh, so um, it it doesn't surprise me that M- Romania like Poland has been taking a you know a, a hard line against Russia, and is being armed in the way that you know you you just said. Yeah. I'm not saying uh, all Romanians think like this, but there is this tradition in Romanian politics. Yeah, uh, Redat says, why are the Russians and the Chinese making the gas deals in euros and not in rubles or RMB? Straightforward, very straightforward. Uh, RMB are not yet fully convertible, but I think the deals in euros are transitional and in a couple of years they will be in RMB. The reason they are in euros instead of dollars, which is the currency in which most international trade and especially energy trade was conducted, is because of course the United States has been trying to use the dollar as a foreign policy instrument and there's even talk now that as part of the sanctions package, Russian banks will be, big Russian state banks, will be prevented from converting dollars into rubles. So because the Europeans are not prepared to do that, they're not prepared to say that euros can't be converted into rubles. Um, It's the currency of choice for these transactions at the moment until the point is reached when the entire um, business is transferred into RMB, which is only a matter of time. All right. Uh, Black Tie says Zelensky should take his troops off the Russian border, send a real powerful message to NATO and the neocons. Just a fantasy of mine. I was thinking about that today too, actually, uh, yeah. Black Tie. I was thinking, wouldn't it be interesting if Zelensky seeing his country, mm-hmm. country's economy implode, seeing his own position yeah. It, you know, really uh, precarious. I mean, he's he's in a tough spot. Yeah, would it be interesting if he called up uh, the Russians and said, "Look, let's just make a deal, and uh, you guys help me get out of this." This mess. yeah, no, well, well <laughs> that would has, be interesting. In fairness to him, he's been trying to meet Putin, uh, and he's been trying to do it for over a year. But of course, he wants to meet Putin in the context of Putin accepting that Russia is in fact a party in the Ukrainian conflict, which is, of course, something the Russians will never do. As far as they're concerned, it is an internal conflict. Now, if Zelensky did that, if he tried to act in the kind of way that's been suggested, if he pulled back his troops from the Donbass, if he started to implement the Minsk agreement, well, that would be good for Ukraine if he could survive. And there's been a whole series of articles in the British media which say that Minsk is unachievable because no Ukrainian government that tried to implement it would survive. So that's an admission in Britain, in fact, that any Ukrainian government that tried to implement Minsk would face a coup. 
So that's the problem. Now, how you get around that problem, I don't know. But of course, if you pour arms into Ukraine, not arms that can fight the Russians. I mean, you know, javelin missiles and these light anti-tank missiles that the British have supplied and the Stinger missiles that the Lithuanians are going to supply, which are really being routed to uh, Ukraine from the United States. Which Those is illegal, are not going to, isn't it? Which is illegal, absolutely. But it's not going to deter the Americans at all. But, <laughs> sorry, the Russians at all. It's not going to change the military balance between Ukraine and Russia. But these arms are going, some of them, to these very, very dangerous people in Ukraine itself. And that strengthens them in any move they might make against any Ukrainian government that tries to pursue peace. So, you know, just just that's the problem in Ukraine. And we're making that problem worse. Yeah. Um, Amrit says, because uh, she is Russian, she is targeted. China and Russia should take samples of Western athletes and test them uh, t t times enough to make it hell for the West. Uh, um, um, the, the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, the various sports federations around the world, which are very much Western dominated, would never accept that. The, the reality, and one has to face this, is that the architecture of doped, doping and you know dope, dope, testing for doping is, is is dominated by western laboratories and western structures and it's going to remain like that for a very very long time yeah the whole novichok scripple affair yeah well, and the navalny and the navalny absolutely absolutely yeah. um darren williams says off topic but something funny i read today a while back officials in turkey wanted to ban the sale of foreign DNA kits inside Turkey because many people found out that they were Greek, Persian, or Armenian, not a lick of Central Asian DNA. I've heard the same story. I, I'm not going to comment more about it, but it is it is it isn't entirely surprising because, of course, um, to say it very gently, Turkey. Turks came very late to this part of the world, if you look at history. And apparently they didn't come in enormous numbers. So it's not unusual for uh, the people who come in and who become the rulers to, uh, um, you know, their, their civilization is accepted by everybody else. But the underlying population always remains the same. The same, by the way, has happened in the Middle East. I mean, the, during the Arab conquests of the um, 7th and 8th centuries, um, the actual number of people who came out of the Arabian Peninsula in the time of Muhammad the Prophet uh, and conquered all these regions was very small. So people in Iraq, in Egypt, in Syria... They are the same people. They are, you know, in terms of DNA, descendants of the same people who were there previously. And that's become very clear recently. The Arab language was adopted. The Arab religion, which is Islam, was adopted. Um, um, Arabic civilization gradually came to be adopted too, which was, of course, in itself influenced by the civilizations of all these areas that the Arabs conquered. But, of course, the underlying DNA structure um, is the same. Interesting. From Talos, uh, American attack in Syria against the IS leader. What do you make of the situation in Syria, Libya and Iraq? Getting the sense that the Russians in Syria are close to saying enough and that they're pushing now hard against Turkey. They're, being, they're making... Uh, more forceful steps in Idlib province, apparently. And it seems also that there's now um, open fighting going on between the Kurds and the Turkish military in northeast Syria, too. Um, I think the big thing to look out for is the latest meeting of the Arab League, which is apparently going to be happening in March. There's apparently a head of steam building up within the Arab League for the Syria to be readmitted into the Arab League. And if that happens, then the politics of this is going to change 
because those American troops in Syria, which are apparently being quietly drawn down anyway, are going to be American troops illegally occupying Arab land. If And at that point, if the Arab League supports Syria's demand for them to go, it's very difficult to see how they'll be able to stay. All right. Pauli says, Dutch uh, Aryan Kanfu... Confis, cyber expert, friend of Julian Assange, went to Norway summer 2018 and never came back. He knew too much about the government interfering. Thanks. I've read about uh, this story. Have you read I, about this? I, I haven't. I, I haven't read about it like a year yeah. ago, I think. I don't know if it's the same. If it's the same guy, but yeah, he's the guy that, that disappeared, right? Right, oh, Paulie. Okay. I think. Yeah. I think that's the guy. Oh, and, that's, uh, that's, yeah. That yeah, is, he was. Is... He was close to Assange. Yeah. Well, okay, WikiLeaks. Well. Wow. That is sinister, actually. I mean, people don't just disappear. Yeah, I, I, I think the story that, came out like a year ago or like yeah. a year and a half ago. I don't know if it's resurfaced now again because they're mm. trying to figure out what happened well, to, uh, to him. Wow. But yeah, thank you very much for that. I'm going to go look that up and see what happened yes, after the stream. Yeah. Uh, but Elena Diaz says, can China use the USA's big debt against the USA to end all this never-ending wars? Isn't China a big holder of U.S. debt? If no, it, why not? It is, but I don't think one should uh, uh, exaggerate that. Uh, I mean, it held about a trillion dollars of US debt. The US is a trillion, is a twenty trillion dollar economy. I don't think it, I, I don't think it'd be in China's interests to try to try to use its holdings of US debt in that kind of way. And by the way, the biggest holder of US debt is not China; it's Japan. So I, I don't think it gives China the leverage that people imagine it does. I think the Chinese game is much longer and much more calculated, which is gradually you know, to forge ahead with this link up with Russia, which, as I said, addresses China's historic vulnerabilities and then develop what somebody in another pro in a in a in a live stream i think it was one of my own live streams i think it was hey man talked about as china's tributary system its new tributary system in other words its new network of friendships and alliances which is what a lot of the belt and road initiative is all about and gradually that will position china as the central player in the world economic system and that will start to marginalize the U.S. if the U.S. itself isn't careful. Yeah. And uh, Aryan, yes, he was uh, canoeing in Norway 2018, and he disappeared. I remember that story. Yeah. Fascinating okay. stuff. Uh, let's see. Zoran says, uh, I just do not see how does this stupid, how does, how does this not spiral into civil war and ultimately a great international war? It always has. And it's just impossible to see how it does not again. It, 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 I, I presume you mean Ukraine. It is not. Well, first of all, we must understand that there is a civil war underway in Ukraine anyway. I mean, there is there is fighting all the time in the Donbass. Uh, and to be absolutely clear about this, and there's been it's been confirmed recently in an article in foreign policy in the United States. And everybody who's been there accepts that the people who the Ukrainians are fighting, the Ukrainian military is fighting, the militias in the Donbass are overwhelmingly made up of the people of the Donbass who are East Ukrainians. So this is already a civil war. And just this morning, I was reading an article in the Financial Times about the situation in Odessa. And it was clear that the, peop the people in Odessa who are uh, overwhelmingly Russian, and who identify with Russia, that they're very restive and that there's pressures and uh, um, uh, conflict under the surface in Odessa as well. So it is a civil war. The big problem, the big question, which is the one that you are addressing, is this civil war is being kept under some level of control at the moment. But if it flares up, it will be incredibly dangerous and it would indeed risk sucking in other powers alternatively it could be used to provoke a wider conflict but i have to say this when we are talking about other powers 
that might become involved. In this situation, the Russians are so overwhelmingly strong that realistically, the ability of other powers to involve themselves in that kind of scenario in Ukraine is very, very limited huh. indeed. Even Biden admitted that um, in that press conference uh, uh, the other day. Mm -hmm. Okay, you gave a great answer, Alexander, for uh, Ukraine. But Zoran said, not Ukraine, but everywhere. Truckers, inflation, Western oh, leaders being dumb, dumb, oh, all I of see. it. So Ukraine included, but also oh, everywhere else. Well, well, no, let's I not mean, go I, everywhere. I, I, let's I, not go I, everywhere, I, I, but let's go Canada. How do you see, how do you see yeah, uh, I mean, the Canada uh, issue resolving? I if you had to take I, a guess. Or looking back at history, how would you say right, this, okay, this might I, unfold? I, Right, I think I think much the most likely scenario in Canada is assuming the truckers don't disperse mm -hmm. and this thing snowballs, there will be uh, at some point a decision by uh, the Liberal Party, by other political leaders in Canada to tell Justin Trudeau to, to step down. That seems to me, that seems to me the most likely the scenario there. The smart move, exactly. Now, of course, if they if they if they did something stupid. If they unleash the riot police on the truckers, which is, I think, distinctly possible if Justin Trudeau stays, then, of course, the protests could escalate even further. I still don't think they would look to take use violence in that way. But if the authorities escalate even further and, you know, real kinetic violence is used, well, then, of course, we could be in a very, very dangerous situation indeed. But we're a long way from that point. Let's hope it doesn't come to that. So that's Canada. But your greater point that there is conflict and tension all over the West now is absolutely, and not just all over the West, but everywhere, but especially if it's the West that we're really talking about. It's absolutely correct. And... In my opinion, the danger, especially in Europe, less so in the United States, but to some extent, even in the United States, is not civil war exactly. It is systems collapse. If we could suddenly start to see nothing working anymore, the currencies crash, political systems crash, and that would lead to massive uh, depression, uh, recessions and severe chaos and a breakdown in political processes, which would be extremely dangerous. So either we find some way of democratic evolution out of this impasse that we're in, or that I think is the risk that we're really facing. Yeah, Martin Jack says the health, the health and care bill, police crime sentencing and court bills, online safety bill, the elections bill, do these proposed laws move the UK closer to dictatorship? Well, they lead it closer in, an, in a closer into an authoritarian direction. Now, if you have an authoritarian system, that can eventually evolve into a dictatorship. I can't see who the dictator would be at the moment. I mean, Boris, Liz Truss, Keir Starmer. Keir Starmer is a slightly more creepy character, but I can't believe that he would really make a dictator, to be honest. But... Um, you know, you can have a system that is deeply authoritarian and very controlled without it being exactly a dictatorship. I lived through that in my childhood in Greece, for example. It's very controlled, very oppress repressive political system that existed there in the, in the early 60s. And um, that did, of course, eventually become a dictatorship, as I also experienced. But, you know, I, I think we're some way from a dictatorship. Let's worry so much about dictatorship. Let's worry about the fact that all of these things that are being done are highly repressive, that they violate fundamental legal protections and human rights, and that they are dangerous and wrong in themselves. Yeah. W. Baker says the idiotic behavior of Western leaders is a feature, not a fault. And the Mary Democrat says incompetence in political office is intentional. When the electorate sees the government's brazen ignorance of their will, people despair and are likely to succumb. Explanation, look no further than Anna Freud and Edward Bernays. It works like 
any other abusive relationship. That is profoundly true, actually. That is that is that is very. I mean, there's a lot of insight in those comments. Um, I, I think, first of all, that it is intentional in the sense that um, if you are, you know, a globalist oligarch, you don't want clever people in government. <laughs> that, I mean, that's the obvious point to make because clever people in government might threaten you. They might say, look, I'm the prime minister, I'm the president, I should be in charge, not you. I'm the person who's elected. And of course, if they're prime minister or president or those sort of things, then of course they have, in theory at least, the chain of command at their disposal. So oligarchs don't want clever people in government. And, you we know, did a show on this for the Bolsheviks. Exactly. Exactly. The, the, yeah. exactly. And Kerensky. It's, yeah. it's exactly the same. I mean, they, they, want, they want weak, incompetent people. But of course, and that's again, you come back to that program which we made. What did that eventually lead to? It led to systems collapse in Russia. Russian, the Russian Revolution is a form of systems collapse. And of course, what came out of it was something completely different from what the oligarchs. Well, you had a Lenin. Someone much exactly. clever than, I know. Exactly. than the oligarchs and, and exactly. these guys. Exactly. I mean, do exactly. we have that today? No, we don't at the moment. We don't see that in the West. But that's that's always a that's always a possibility that someone might like that might come. Twenty years before the Russian Revolution, Lenin was a um, unknown scribbler writing books about how you know. Uh, uh, Russia's future was capitalist. I mean, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm not exaggerating. Um, it took a while before his uh, political skills and his um, ruthlessness and focus became clear. And even then, of course, he needed the political structures to gradually be dismantled in order to rise to the top. So, you know, if but, you know, do we have 20 years? I mean, you know, in a way, I mean, you know, I, there's a famous poem in Greek by a Greek poet called Kavafi about, you know, the waiting for the barbarians when you're in a, syst in a systems collapse situation, in that case, Rome, that the barbarians are a solution. I mean, in Russia, the Bolsheviks were a solution of a kind to the systems collapse that the oligarchs had created. Is that a worse outcome than a state of systems collapse in which there is no solution? I wouldn't want to answer that question. I wouldn't want to be put in a position or to live through a process in which that question was answered. Better that we don't ever get there, but it's up to us. Yeah. Uh, Danish says that trust isn't strong on geography. <laughs> <laughs> Well said, no. well said. No. Uh, um, let's see. It tells you a lot Idiocra about our ed education system. Yeah. Right <laughs> <by the way. laughs> That's all I can say. Boy, Boy what? <laughs> I I'm still in shock after that, uh, yeah. after that meeting. Anyway, uh, W. Yeah. Baker says, Idiocracy, the silly movie, is now a documentary. Yeah. And uh, Brian said, uh, just wondering how other countries around the world are viewing the events over the past couple of days with trust. Well, I think that the whole world is probably laughing and at the same time stunned. I think that there is, uh, I mean, it, it must be a combination of the two, actually. I mean, you know, countries like India, which has a tremendous foreign service. And, you know, there's been lots of criticisms and comments about Modi. I've heard many people say that Modi comes from a very poor background. He's not a very educated man, but in a negotiation with Putin, he can he can give a good account of himself. He he can do the same with Xi Jinping. So what are the Indians going to be thinking when they look at their former imperial master and they see Liz Truss? What are the Brazilians? What are the Chinese? What is all the world thinking? Well, it just doesn't. As a British person, it makes me shudder. Yeah. Well, a friend of mine in Greece the other day, uh, yesterday, um, he yeah. told me that uh, he was like, did you see the the, uh, the press conference between Truss and Lavrov? And I said, yeah. 
and he was just like, um, I remember when the British had the best diplomatic corps in the world. Absolutely. And he said, I can't believe that, that it's come to this. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, people remember. Absolutely. And bear in mind, bear in mind, I mean, she comes from a, um, an educated background. Her, her father was a professor of mathematics, or so I understand. And um, I mean, she, she, uh, she's not somebody, as I said, who comes, who comes from um, nowhere. And she went. I, think, you know, I, think, oh, oh, I was wondering oh, oh, oh. you were going to say her father was a professor of geography. <laughs> well, I, know. I don't know, but uh, um, but you know, I think, you know, she she studied in you know various universities. She went to Canada. She went to all sorts of things. How is it possible to be as ignorant as that? I mean, I, I just it I, it just beggars belief to me. And it shows how, um, as I say, brain dead our political class in Britain has become. I, I mean, I'm really dismayed by it. Tunabi Bond says John Cleese would have done much better. <laughs> of course, he would have. Yes. Done. yes. Well, it's absolutely. As I said, I mean, it's it was a Monty Python sketch. I mean, I don't know the, how many people know Monty Python, but you know, the Ministry of Silly Walks comes to mind. I mean, walking around Moscow in that way, it was a classic city walk. And of course, the the uh, the appearance, the performance between with with Lavrov. I mean, I mean, the, I, I, I have to say, I, I I got the sense that Lavrov was stunned. Actually, <laughs> he couldn't believe the imbecile that he was that he found himself dealing with yeah uh byronicus says brilliant to see that assange cause the assange cause has raised 52 million yeah that's fantastic absolutely, absolutely. That. and it, it, it is starting to build in britain as well i mean it took a very very long time but um we'll see what happens with the supreme court decision which is going to come well who knows how long but um the um, uh, the reason the High Court, I think, wavered and certified the case as proper for um, hearing by the Supreme Court was that I, uh, my understanding is that the legal profession, including some serving judges, were very, very unhappy by the High Court's decision. And I think that has galvanised opinion in Britain. And obviously you see growing support for Assange around the world, as right. reflected in this a uh, huge increase in funds. Yeah. Uh, Jerry F said that says that CNN is still hyping about Russian troop buildup. Oh, and Digar, yeah. And Digar says, I thought the athletes were tested before the games. Why after she won? Exactly. Well, well, indeed, exactly. I mean, I think, I think, well, this is an old test, but why was it only released now? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's astonishing. But uh, apart the buildup, well, they're, they're talking, well, they're talking about it all the time. The, the, the U.S. government is talking about it. Boris Johnson yesterday was saying, you know, we are at the most dangerous moment since, you know, uh, the, well, I don't know quite when, the Second World War or the Roman invasion or the Norman invasion. I mean, I don't know. Anyway, but he was, they're all talking up this danger of war. And again, you have Lavrov trying patiently to explain to Liz Truss this isn't real and as he said, as, as Alex said, he said, it's, you know, it's like the talk about st the stony ground. Yeah, yeah. It was, you know, you, you, you see all this, and it just bounces off. It doesn't seem to, it doesn't seem to register. <laughs> they want war so bad. They're trying to manifest it. They want Russia to invade Ukraine so bad. Absolutely. I mean, that's just the God honest truth. Absolutely. They're itching for it. Yeah. And the Russians are like, we're not going to invade. And they're like, well, no. we're going to force you to do it. Well, <laughs> well, I mean, one of the most interesting things Lavrov said, as I said, is we are not making any threats. All the threats are being made against us. And it's true. They want Russia. They want they a want, war. They want you know, a war. They want Russia to war, invade. Yeah. War. The, the, there was this, the, the Chinese commented on this there's a big article editorial in global times again you can find a program about it that, uh, that on locals and on my channel in which they said the country that wants war in ukraine is the united states 
Yeah. Well, let's not talk about the United States. Let's talk about the Sullivans and the Psaki's and the Newlands and those. Yeah, the Americans those, don't want it. The American Americans people, don't want this I, I, at all. At but, all. I've been, I've been reading polling about this. I, I, I've been getting some private polling that's been done by people in the Republican Party, and they show overwhelming opposition to any uh, war, getting the United States sucked into any war in Ukraine. And also that, you know, the American people do not want to be in, have all these additional burdens from the sanctions inflicted upon them. So the America, America doesn't support this. There is a faction that has gained control of the government that does. Yeah. My, my worry there is that, um, God, I, I really hope that uh, Russian intelligence is, is on its on top of its game and it's able yeah. to thwart any false flags. I mean, there's only so much they can they, they can, can uh, thwart, obviously, but uh, hopefully they can stop any any damaging false flags. And yeah. if uh, a false flag does succeed or if some type of provocation succeeds, I just pray that it's not. Uh, I don't even know how to say it. It's just not enough to force Putin's hand because we all got to remember one thing. We talked about this in a program that we'll put up this weekend. We were talking about it. At the end of the day, Putin is also a politician. That's right. He has political capital. And yeah. if uh, something devastating happens yes. to uh, Russian citizens, uh, Putin is going to have to act. Otherwise, Absolutely. his position is uh, is threatened. I mean, there's... You know, you go back to Absolutely. Turkey and when they shot down that jet. I mean, I was I was in Russia at the time and people were were pissed off. And there was a lot of people who were telling Putin, you need to act in a military in a military way. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. you know, Putin definitely used some of his political capital yeah. to not act uh, along military uh, lines. But, you know, he spent that political capital. But there's only so far you can push. Absolutely. That's one. entirely right. Same, by the way, happened when that. British frigate sailed close to Crimea. He got came in for a lot of criticism in Russia for not taking an even stronger line about that. And if Russian citizens are endangered in Donbass or Russian speakers are endangered in Donbass, then he will have to react. The one thing I will say is, the more I've been reading about the Ukrainian military and the more I've been asking about it, the more weak and chaotic it comes across. And yes, they could stage some really hideous incident. I have no doubt about that. But if it's a case of advancing on the Donbass, it doesn't seem at the moment as if they're up to doing it. So that, that I, th I think, is one of the constraining factors in this situation. Well said. Zad the God says, how can you criticize Biden if he's not capable of making decisions? Blame the committee behind him. Well said. Oh, uh, well, that's a very good point, actually. Yes. <laughs> yeah, very, very true. Um, Jerry says there are even members of Trudeau's Liberal Party criticizing his handling of the yeah. Freedom Convoy. Yeah, yeah. I noticed. I saw that. I saw that myself. It's a very important sign. Uh, um, its support is cracking. Um, I, I mean, he, he, I, I mean, I, we we should. I mean, it was a Ceausescu moment. I mean, he didn't go to the gallery and he wasn't booed by the people, as I said, that he'd selected to come out and share him. But in effect, it's almost like that, because he's come out, made all of these incredible statements, and instead of the liberal faithful, you know, coming out in a chorus and saying, you know, you know, great, Justin, we are 100% behind you against all these evil people who are doing all these bad things, you're starting to see criticism instead. Yeah. This is a great comment from Leafy Bug. Trudeau is a drama teacher. That should have been his station in <laughs> life. Somehow he became the prime minister of an important country. I like that last phrase. Somehow he yeah. became the prime minister of an important country. It's a brilliant comment. It's a brilliant comment. Leafy very Bug, you're very welcome. And thank you very much for that one. I, I agree. And w ba yeah. And W. Baker says these people don't know where their food comes from. That's the basic no. level of ignorance we're dealing with. And food yes. doesn't come from the grocery store. <laughs> yes. And by the way, that truth that, that they don't know about these things extends all the way up to people like Klaus Schwab. I mean, I've read his things, some of them. <laughs> Not everything he's written, but some <laughs> of them. And he doesn't understand how things actually work. 
the, the, the world he's describing, the vision of the world he's describing. It, I mean, it's 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 a sort of technological thing that cannot function. I mean, he doesn't understand tech. I mean, I'm you know I'm not a technological person, but I understand. I know enough about economics and technology to to realize it doesn't work like he thinks it does. Yeah. W. Baker says a corrupt money breeds cor complete corruption. And King King G's says 7.5%, more like 10 to 20%. I agree with them both counts. First point is excellent. There's a very famous expression that you uh, uh, find um, in law enforcement, which is that about corrupt situations, which is that bad money always drives out good. And it's true. Yeah. <laughs> and it's true. Uh, Danish says, Xi Putin's statement was a really big event. Most of the world yeah. didn't report except in passing. Absolutely. Uh, um, by the way, the one person who did grasp the fact was Josep Borrell, uh, this terrible EU high representative. But, you know, he seems to have suddenly, he seems to have realized, uh, you know, whilst everybody's talking about Ukraine, this massive event has been happening. And um, it, 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 it requires attention. Of course, his solutions were non-existent, but at least he was, at least he noticed. Yeah, here are two important uh, statements, Alexander. First one from Tsunami Bomb. Macron is under fire during his re-election campaign. He feels that he has to do something. Yeah. So does the opposite of Boris Johnson because of Brexit and Alkis. You've mentioned Alkis for Macron. Absolutely. And Leafy Bug says there was a quad meeting in Melbourne today. Blinken again showed his strategic tin ear by trying to get the Indians to condemn the Russians due to alleged transgressions against Ukraine. The Indians weren't having any of that, of course. This is madness. The quad only makes sense strategically as a counterweight to China. But Blinken yeah. is trashing whatever value the quad may hold. I completely agree. Both are very, very important points, very important statements and uh, on Macron and on the fact that he's doing what he's doing because there's election pressures on him of that, there's no question. And he knows perfectly well, by the way, that what he's doing with meeting Putin plays well in France. And he also knows well that if he gets a deal of some kind over Ukraine or whatever, that will play even better in France. So absolutely, election considerations cannot be underestimated. Uh, by the way, if uh, Le Pen or Zemmour were to win the election in France, they would do all the same things that Macron was has been doing, and they do them much more. Mm -hmm. I mean, Zemmour has actually talked about the need for an alliance. Was it with Russia or was it Mélenchon? But anyway, the, the left-wing candidate. But this, what we're talking about is... Politics in France is different. It's almost mainstream there. And he does have that support apart from within the globalist Atlanticist grouping in Paris, who are probably very unhappy about what he's doing, but they're not the people who at the end of the day can give the votes. So absolutely, that is absolutely true. And on the quad, I didn't know about this meeting in Melbourne. I didn't know what had happened there. But thank you, and that's really useful, and it doesn't surprise me. India has consistently made clear to the United States that its good relations with Russia are not up for negotiation. Uh, uh, they hosted Putin in November when all this uh, er uh, Ukraine war hysteria had started. They sided with the Russians at the Security Council uh, debate a few uh, about a week ago. And it looks like they've taken the same stance in the quad. And uh, you're absolutely right. Bringing this up all the time in that kind of way, what it will eventually do is it's going to make the Indians question the good sense of the quad. It will make them feel that uh, the quad, far from just being something that India can use to help it with China, it's putting India in a position where it has to follow the U.S. lead exactly. uh, on issues exactly. that India doesn't want to exactly. follow. Well, so, and that's that's exactly right. Exactly. Exactly. You nailed it. Um, uh, 
Are the jackets you're wearing available on the shop? They will be on Monday. Mm. A couple of questions there. And, and so these, these and will be on the shop. Yeah, and they're they're great. Uh, yeah. We're, we're testing them out. And uh, Leafy Bug says, the Chinese claim that the Russia-China relationship is better than the alliance seems completely correct relative yeah. to the US-led alliance structures in which all of the countries involved have dangerously unbalanced defense postures. Yes, I completely agree. And I would add, by the way, again, that uh, Lavrov apparently tried to explain this to Liz Truss. <laughs> over the course of this meeting, we in judging by the press conference, he actually said to her, you know, the difference between our relationship, because Liz Truss asked him about this relationship between Russia and China, and he said, look, we are, we're friends, we're forging our friendship ever closer, and the great thing about this is that this isn't a situation of leader and follower, which is what you have in NATO, and that's why it's so much better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Carol says, Russia, I think, is ahead of the game regarding being pushed into war by the U.S. That will help, I think, in them avoiding it. That's the whole. I point. agree with it. I agree with that, actually. And to answer a point that Alex made earlier, there was the, the, the Russian intelligence chief was a man called Narishkin. Uh, uh, he actually said, you know, that the Russians have been keeping an eye on the various people in eastern Ukraine who are busy with possible attempts to start false flags. So he's he's actually said so. So the I, Russian intelligence is keeping an eye on this. But of course, there's a limit to what they can do. Yeah. And Leafy Bug says there is zero appetite amongst the populace in the West for foreign wars. The sad fact is that the critical mass of our people are perfectly willing to go to war with their fellow citizens. I'm afraid there is some truth to this. Now, I'm going to add something else. Um, Western publics have been very accepting disastrously accepting of wars that Western countries have waged around the world and also sanctions policies that Western countries have waged around the world. Of course, if war is brought onto their own doorstep, which it might be in the situation in Ukraine, and of course, if they start to suffer economically as a result of sanctions, which they would experience properly for the first time, well, that is going to have, I suspect, a massive enlightening effect. I mean, we mustn't ever make the mistake in the West of thinking that because that sanctions is something we can only impose on other people and they won't be imposed upon us or that the effects won't ever affect us. We're now seeing that they can and they will Kennedy will. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, Shelley Beach says uh, the case for Castro is that not only is there quite a physical resemblance, but yeah. the timeline also works out between when Pierre and Margaret visited Cuba and when Justin was born. And we all know Mama was a rolling stone. <laughs> wow. Yeah. The, yeah, yeah I, I've heard that. I've heard exactly yeah, the same. And yeah. the physical resemblance is indeed there. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Talos says in Ukraine, could you see the U.S. leading a coup, placing a person far worse uh, than Avakov putting in charge the Azov or the right sector? I, I There's been lots of discussion about this. There's some speculation about it. It's known that the U.S. is very unhappy with Zelensky. It's known that Zelensky is very unhappy with the U.S. It's a big article in the Wall Street Journal saying that uh, uh, Zelensky's had it up to there with Biden because he feels that Biden's constant talking about the war is destabilizing Ukraine's economy, which is now going down he's the right. tubes. And he's, he's absolutely right. right about that. Um, uh, so there's been a lot of talk that the US is looking for some way to push Zelensky aside and replace it with a more hardline figure. I will, I will repeat what I have said previously. Ukraine experienced what I unhesitatingly call a coup in February 2014. And it led to a crisis in Ukraine, which lost Ukraine Crimea and has left a festering civil war in the East and has created massive destabilization in the Ukrainian economy. Try that again a second time and you risk the entirety of Ukraine. I would not be surprised if at that point the entire House of Cards collapses. If soldiers, for example, start to desert their posts because they don't accept the legitimacy of the president, if 
cities again start to rebel and go their own way. And the article I read in the Financial Times about Odessa suggests that Odessa is barely under Ukrainian control anyway. So, you know, launching a coup in Ukraine, doing that a second time, could have consequences that the US obviously has not imagined. Yeah, and Europe is going to pay for it. Um, Absolutely. And Europe yeah. is going to pay for it. Yeah. yeah, Sparky says, lucky Putin isn't naive enough to fall into traps. Well, absolutely. He's an experienced leader. I mean, he's been he's been there at the top of Russian politics now since 1999, 22 years. So he's been around a long time. He knows he's he knows his way around politics extremely well. And of course, he was he's he's been uh, he served for a time, as we know, in the KGB in East Germany. But that, as I said, I think is a misunderstood affair. But he's been he was he's been director of the fsb he gets all sorts of people he's a highly intelligent and very well educated man who speaks german and i uh, actually i understand pretty good english so he he sees his way around and of course he's very very well briefed unlike this trust <laughs> <laughs> flying boar says what will happen if russia invades ukraine how will this affect the west well, I, 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 I again must correct that. I don't think Russia will invade Ukraine, but they might launch a counteroffensive into Ukraine. Let's assume that that happens. Let's assume that that happens. Uh, very quickly, the Ukrainian army would be defeated. I mean, Scott Ritter told me that in the event that that happens, he thinks the Ukrainian military, there would be mass surrenders. It would be more a case of rounding them all up than of actually fighting them. I mean, there would be some units that would fight, but most of the Ukrainian army would disintegrate very fast. Um, so let's assume that we get that situation. Ukraine would be defeated. Ukraine's position as a state would be in jeopardy. The West is mobilized and starts to impose sanctions, massive sanctions, the sanctions they've been talking about. So the Russians uh, can't convert dollars into rubles. Um, the um, uh, Nord Stream 2 pipeline is cancelled. The United States and the European Union impose energy, uh, sorry, um, uh, technology export restrictions. So what would happen? Well, the ruble would fall. There would be a severe steep fall in the ruble, but it would eventually rebound. Most of Russian trade is carried out in euros now. At least the uh, gas trade with Europe is. They'd convert a lot of it into dollars. They would forge ahead in their relations with China. They have a very advanced si science and technology base. They would replace all the science and technology that the U.S. isn't exporting. And it would take them much less time than people in the U U.S. and in Europe imagine. As I said, they are not familiar with the Russian economy terribly well. But in the meantime, there would inevitably be severe disruptions in energy supply. Energy is already running short in Europe. There would be massive concerns about uh, um, problems in the international energy markets. Fuel prices would rise. Food prices would rise. We would see inflation not just in double digits, but probably you know bouncing around 15, 20, perhaps more percent. Western consumers would take a severe hit. The German economy would find itself cut off from cheap and reliable energy in the future and would be, find itself becoming ever less competitive. It will be a massive blow and it would send Europe into deeper economic decline. Yeah. Kurt says, Alexander asked how the Minsk agreement could be implemented only by using protection of Spetsnaz and big Chinese bankroll. Yeah, well, <laughs> I mean, we'll see what happens. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I'm yeah. going to say this straightforwardly. I don't think Ukraine will ever implement the Minsk agreement. I think that uh, Macron is trying to, to get them to do that, but they resisted again in Berlin. I don't think the Ukrainians will ever do it. And I think this thing will fester until eventually Ukraine does 
uh, um, experience an economic crash, and maybe out of that something new will come. Something happens. But yeah. I think I think I think that's that's the most likely scenario in this on the assumption that there isn't a war, and of course the possibility of a war is a very real one, and if an economic crash happens or is at least pending some of these people in Ukraine might actually decide, even without American encouragement, to launch it. Yeah. Chris says, love your show. Watch it daily. Many of us fundamentally disagree with our government. May I suggest using names of capitals instead of countries when possible? London, Washington, Beijing. Thank you. It's a good, it's a very good point, actually. I mean, and when, where the United States is concerned, I think that's actually a particularly good point because one thing is absolutely clear and it's become starkly clear over the last five years, and that is that Washington doesn't speak for America. Yeah, absolutely. Heyman says uh, self-reliance is the best containment strategy. Yeah, which is what the Russians have largely done. Yeah. It's the most autarkic economy in the world. It's so sufficient in food, it's so sufficient in energy, there's very large financial reserves, and it makes nearly all the manufactured goods it needs. Mm -hmm. um, Yamabush says Biden is sending Kamala to Europe to get to grips with the problems. Another example of washing his hands of an intractable problem and using it to further discredit his VP. He's senile, well, it, but cunning. I see the point, actually, and that's not a bad one. Hmm. Hmm. I mean, senile, it's... Senile, but cunning. Senile, but cunning, yeah. Yeah. Michael says that I know for a fact that George Galloway is listening to you. Oh, well. That's cool. Good. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Michael. That's interesting Thank to you, know. Michael. Yeah. Our, our best to George Galloway. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Amrit says Italian governments of the 20th century changed a lot, but all of them had a commitment to Italian industrial development that made Italy yeah. a solid industrial power. Absolutely. I mean, I should say the reality of Italy, post-war Italy especially, is that, of course, Ita Italian prime ministers changed very regularly. But in reality, the Italian political system was actually pretty stable, always dem dominated by the Christian Democrats. And as you correctly said, a, a, a deep commitment to strengthening Italian industrial strength. And Italy economically actually did very well. I mean, they had higher inflation than some countries, but Italy became the second strongest industrial power in Europe in the years after the Second World War. Overtook France and overtook Britain. Mm -hmm. Raul says, uh, according to Sputnik, Paris mobilized more than 7,000 police to contain the convoy of truckers protesting coup restrictions. Will they be as successful as Canada? <laughs> we'll see. I mean, I, I, we said lots of things about Macron, which are positive, because on the diplomatic issues, he's showing some understanding of the realities on domestic ones, he's as awful as ever. Well said. Mm. <laughs> Douglas says, what would happen to the city of London's reputation for discretion and secrecy if the UK confiscated Russian oligarch assets? Oh, it would, it would shoot them to pieces, I suspect. But, you know, we, we're in such a demented mood here at the moment amongst the political class that I don't think they're really even able to think about that. One of the big mistakes they're making, by the way, is that I, I truly think that they think that others have no alternative but to come to London and get from London the services that London can offer. They are profoundly wrong about this. They're profoundly wrong about uh, uh, the fact that there are other financial hubs developing in the world. Singapore is becoming a very sophisticated one, for example. Yeah. Freedom Autopsy Report says, after World War II, the French shaved the heads of the French women who serviced the NAZI soldiers. Would Canada have to change its constitution to shave Trudeau's head? Well, that's <laughs> quite a thought. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll leave that there. Um, yeah. D D David Marsh says, thank you very much, Freedom Autopsy Report for that super chat. David Marsh says, 
as uh, as a past writing president in Canada, I have met many of our leaders, especially in Ontario. We are not yeah. dealing with bright people. I agree with that. I said this also about the European Commission. I mean, these people are not bright. That's what makes them particularly dangerous. Dangerous. There you go. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, Mike Mercier says Biden now wants to intervene in the Canadian trucker protest. Yes, he does. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that will solve it. Joe's <laughs> <laughs> what everybody job. needs. <laughs> you, don't need, you don't need to worry. I mean, it's... <laughs> uh, I'm sure the truckers are shaking in their boots. <laughs> Absolutely. Biden's on the case. <laughs> Biden's on the case, yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> um, Brenda Commando says, uh, do you think France and the UK would still be leading the charge on diplomacy. If Biden wasn't president, I still think the U.S. can rebound. But it's sad to see U.S. diplomacy fall so badly. Would Trump be better or not? Trump would definitely have been better. In fact, I'm confident we would never have got into the situation that we're seeing. I mean, you look, uh, ju just consider what's happened this last year. I mean, we, we, we were talking during the election, before the election, about what would happen if Biden came in. And I think it's fair to say that he's exceeded our worst expectations. At least yeah. he's exceeded my worst expectations. I shouldn't talk for Alex, but I think probably Alex would agree with me. So we would certainly be better there. Um, my own view is that American diplomacy is abysmal. The Biden administration has the worst foreign policy team in the world with one exception, <laughs> and that exception is the British. I mean, that's that's the only thing I can say. I mean, uh, 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 and uh, I mean, it's it's it would presumably have been as bad where if Trump had been around. But I, I I'm shocked at how bad it is. Yeah, I don't know if we could survive more years of Biden. I mean, it's just gone on his track. I thought we could. The world as a whole, I thought we can survive it, but. Yeah. I just don't know anymore. <laughs> I mean, the guy's that bad. Yes. Uh, um, Leafy Bug says, I have a question about the financial viability of heterodox sources of opinion, such as yours in the age of big tech censorship, without disclosing any numbers. Have alternative revenue sources like locals been able to bridge shortfalls called by PayPal, deciding to pull the pin? Could there be life beyond YouTube? Not that, yours, not that you're there yet. Uh, if, if the question is, could there be life beyond YouTube? Uh, absolutely. Actually, I think uh, things are looking yeah. really good in, uh, in in alternative media and tech and yes. everything. I yes. mean, yes. Rumble's doing well. Locals is doing well. Yes. Uh, yes. Truth Social is yes. going to be launching its, in yes. uh, this month. Yes. So yes. there's a lot of good things. Yes. I mean, one, one has to be clear. The pressures are still there. They're very great. And, you know, we still experience them. We're not we can't control we... that. Exactly. We, we, we're not there where we would. We were not where we would have been had these pressures not existed. But the fact is they do exist and we are adapting to them and we're adapting to them because we have the support of you, our viewers and our community and people on Locals. If that didn't, if that wasn't there, then of course there would be nothing. Uh, but uh, looking forward, um, we were talking about this, Alex and I were talking about this um, just, just yesterday, I think. We are starting to see an alternative uh, independent media you know, sphere, ecosphere, starting to evolve. And maybe Florida will be maybe the it's yeah. focus. Yeah, Florida seems Chicago. to be a hub. Um, a you know, hub, yeah. Look, Ga Gab has, has shown the way to dealing with censorship as well. So you, everyone yeah. has to credit Gab for what they've done. I mean, yeah. there's, yes. there's a lot of activity now. And yes. It's, and it's yes. positive. It's positive. I mean, you know, this is a, obviously a massive work in progress and we can't compare them with the giants yet, but the giants are not looking as strong as they were. No, Facebook's and, not looking and, good at and, all. And not, not good at all, exactly. And, you know, things are, things are changing and they're changing yeah. in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Facebook's not looking good. Twitter's not exactly. looking good financially. Exactly. So, I mean, exactly. th things are changing. Exactly. exactly. But, you know, I mean, to, to repeat again, that we are still here is because of you. If you weren't there watching us, 
participating in our in on you know on our locals platform, following us on Rumble, doing all of these other things. Well, we wouldn't be here. I mean, because exactly. well, you know, we we've had we've been under an awful lot of pressure. And, you know, I think that's I think all we can reasonably say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well said. Um, and we when we thank you for for all your support. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Um, you you make us want to do this. Absolutely. Wake up yeah. every day and, and get the videos out. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, Sparky. Just, Sparky just, 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 just to say on that, I mean, again, I want to stress the best part of this is not going, you know, reading all those long things and doing videos. It's these live, live streams. It's interacting with you that, that makes it really worthwhile. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Great question. Uh, Freedom Autopsy Report says, have you thought of going to a subscription-based format? Uh, we, we kind of have that with local. That's that's one part of our, yes. of our way yes. to fight big tech yes. and censorship. Yes. But yes. Um, yes. We, we also want to get as much information out to as many people uh, exactly. that we can, that want to listen exactly. to us. As well, I mean, so. that, is, that is part of what we are. Yeah. <laughs> We're we're still, you know, everyone's navigating this new exactly this this new censorship media yes. world. Yes. Unfortunately, yes. I mean, nothing would be easier than to just have well, exactly. one YouTube that would be free speech, and all you have to do yes. is upload to one place, and yes. everything would be easy. But yes. you know, we've seen that, uh, yes. that that's just not in the cards. Yes, absolutely. I mean, bearing in mind, of course, that when we started the Duran, first in 2016, it was just a a web uh, site and then in 2018 when we started our channel i mean it was you know both the website and the channel was started in radically different media environments so we hadn't expected to be have to do all of these things but you know we've been creative we've had your support we're evolving we're thinking you things out all the time and as you can see, we're still here and we still enjoy massively what we do because of our interactions and the support we are getting from you. Yeah. Sparky says, a comforting reminder, Joe Biden's the most capable person in his administration. <laughs> yes, that's probably true, actually. When you look at when you look at Kamala and Blinken and all the rest, mm -hmm. no doubt. <laughs> yeah. Uh, from Darren. I mean, do you can I just yeah. say, can I just say the the foreign policy team is the worst I can remember. I haven't really talked about the economics team, but they're definitely the worst I can remember. They are a bizarre mixture of K uh, uber Keynesians and ideologues. And what they've done to the economy of the United States is just, is just incredible. When the Democrats last time started a massive funding program that ran out of control in the 1960s. They didn't intend it to end like that. But this bunch have deliberately tried to run the economy hot. I've been reading them say it. And here we see we and here we see the consequences. But of course, you know, the president tells us not to worry because inflation <laughs> don't worry. is something to worry about. Yes. If Biden says don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> don't worry. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, um, from Darren, do you think Looney Liz Truss will be our next prime minister? I hope not. I mean, I, I, I have to say, I mean, I never thought she would make a good prime minister, not by any stretch, but um, after what happened in Moscow, I, I have to say the idea makes me shudder. I mean, the, 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 the way in which she had conducted herself throughout this trip to Moscow, not just, you know, this bungled meeting with uh, uh, Lavrov, but all this, you know, parading around Red Square and having oneself photographed and dressing up in a fur hat and all that. I mean... I, I don't want a person like that to be my prime minister. Absolutely not. Yeah. Uh, zero one, Ludias, thank you for your super sticker. And Sparky says elites can only fool themselves so much that they are the smartest. So dismiss people who know the big picture. This is how the system works and how they interact. Absolutely. Absolutely correct. That's entirely right. By the way, uh, on that point, that Chinese editorial in Global Times I was reading, 
actually made that very point. Is it about the U.S. specifically, the, the the Washington leadership, and it said the Washington elite. You see, these people think they're smart, but they've got no real grasp of reality. Yeah. Um, Rich says Shanghai, Moscow, Saint Petersburg, Nizhny Novgorod, Beijing, Hong Kong, Shenzhen, Guangzhou, and many. And many big and solid industrial and financial centers around China yeah. and Russia. Yeah, absolutely true. I mean, Russia, Mo Moscow now has a financial hub. I mean, it is now a financial hub. I mean, it wasn't that to any real sense in 2014. And, you know, the Russian stock market almost collapsed in 2008 during the financial crisis. But it's far stronger and more resilient today. It's not big. It doesn't not on the scale of Shanghai. Uh, but, you know, there's, there's issues about the way the one in Shanghai is right there. But certainly the Russians, the Chinese, can develop their own financial systems, and they are doing so. Yeah, Life of Brian says the censorship regime is a good thing. It just means their hand is forced. They've been censoring insidiously and invisibly since the 96 Telecom Act. Well, I, I think that's probably true but of course it's made our lives alex and mine yes. infinitely harder i mean as alex said if we had one place we could do our programs and what uh, 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 and, and could publish them well that would make our lives a lot easier than they than they are but anyway it, it yeah. makes you it, work harder and makes it's not the real yeah it's not the reality yeah. and we we deal no, with it no. we, we deal with all, it, of, exactly. us. all, all of us all of us yeah. All of um, Zach Boyle says a web interview mentioned Russian oligarchs transferring gold into the World Bank of London. If accurate, doesn't a Ukraine conflict entertain confiscation? I can't, I, well, I, I haven't heard that, and I'd be very, very wary before I assume that was true. The the Russian government gives me the impression of having a very, very good idea now of where everybody has their money, and any oligarch caught doing that is going to find themselves in very serious trouble if they're in, if they're anywhere in russia yeah freedom autopsy report says goebbels said the greatest threat to the state is the truth yeah very good well said and in fact and in fact uh, um during that press conference with liz trust uh, again <laughs> um um lavrov mentioned goebbels and you know his method of conducting propaganda and he said that this was worse than Goebbels, what, what is happening now. Yeah. Gordon So, 158HK. Thank you very much, Gordon, for that. Keep up the analysis. I find your analysis fascinating, eye-opening, and accurate. Thank yeah. you very much, Gordon, for that. We appreciate it. Uh, Darren Alevi says, do you think that after the South Korean elections, uh -huh. the U.S. will try and ramp up another theater of war to try and put pressure on Kim in an attempt to try and pressure China on another front? I think that we, I mean, that would be incredibly dangerous. I mean, I think, first of all, I mean, North Korea remains a very, very difficult country to really know or understand. With, with, with the Russians, at least you can goad them, but you, you get a sense that they, they understand nuclear weapons very well. They understand what nuclear weapons can do. They they're, they're, have the self-confidence and the self-control to use them wisely, and better still, not at all. With North Korea, I have to say, it seems to me that taking on North Korea in that way, when we know so little about it, and we know so little about, about the decision-making processes in Pyongyang, uh, would, would just be beyond reckless. I mean, no US administration up to now has risked starting any kind of front with North Korea. And I hope this administration doesn't. But, you know, it's the worst administration in foreign policy I've ever seen. So who knows? Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, Turia says the problem with economists is universal. A new survey shows more than half are supporting a command economy. It is sad to see science go full voodoo. Wasn't it? Mm -hmm. I completely well agree. Yeah. Well said, well said there. And um, let's see, a couple of more here. Uh, Leafy Bug says, just the appearance of U.S. foreign policy, people screams amateur hour. I'm sure yeah. these men wear very expensive suits, but somehow their statures make their suits look like $99 specials. Uh, 
absolutely correct. I mean, that's beautifully said, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Alan says, what will happen after the midterms if the Dems are trounced? That is a huge question, and it's a very, very good question. I think they will, first of all, they will be trounced. The big question is who at that point is leading the Republican Party? Would it be, continue to be Mitch McConnell and his uh, followers, in which case things will continue as always, only they'll continue just to get worse? Or will we see a completely different Republican Party, one which is much closer to the grassroots, in which case all kinds of interesting things are going to start to happen. There will be a pushback, hopefully, against some of the things that the administration has been doing. And there will be the start of a serious attempt, I hope, to rein in some of its foreign policy adventures. By the way, on that, I understand that there's rumblings in Congress, finally, about this uh, 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 Ukraine policy seems that there's some people in the House of Representatives who are unhappy and are now saying so. Um, Senator Menendez says that his sanctions bill has now become stalemated. He can't progress. And I wonder why. And I wonder who's objective, objecting. And of course, we see Bernie Sanders, who, as I said, is a man without any ideas or principles, but who I think is a reliable guide to what part of the Democratic Party faithful are thinking. He's now come out and he said that sanctions are a very bad idea. So we'll yeah. see what comes. Um, let's see. Carol says Liz Trust could lose her job after this disastrous Russian visit, I think. Is oh, it possible? We'll be, it's possible, but it's more likely she'll be promoted to prime minister. Isn't this the iron rule now? The, the more you fail, <laughs> yeah. the more completely you fail, the more you get promoted. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I, I've see. seen yeah. I've seen no criticisms of her in any part of the British media. Bear in mind, the British people, those who don't follow independent media, who don't follow the Iran or don't go into you know the other places, they don't know about what happened, the full story about what happened in Moscow. The media is not reporting it to them, and Britain doesn't have an independent media as sophisticated or as extensive as that in the United States. Thomas says, what does the alliance of Kazakhstan and Belarus to Russia contribute to Eurasian dominance? Certainly gas and min minerals from Kazakhstan. You, you know, that's a very good question. And it's a very well-timed question because Tokayev, the president of uh, Kazakhstan, has just been to Moscow. And he's had a massive meeting with Putin. And he's also met various other Russian officials, including the Russian prime minister, Mishutsin. And um, there's been rumours that Kazakhstan might be thinking of joining the Union State, which is this grouping within the Eurasian Economic Union of Belarus and Russia. But, you know, Kazakhstan might actually start to join it. And of course, Kazakhstan is potentially an immensely rich region. It's very rich in raw materials. It has vast agricultural potential. It became one of the Soviet Union's major grain baskets. So if this grouping were to consolidate, and the, it looks as if it might do, it would certainly enhance Russian economic power and also consolidate Russia's position in central Eurasia. Okay, uh, Ivan is a new member to, to the Duran community. Welcome, Ivan. And Sparky says, 1996 Telecom Act not only allowed unfettered news media consolidation, it removed logistical barriers between telecom companies and governments, which previously inhibited warrantless electronic surveillance. That's a good Yeah, point. absolutely. Good. Very good point. Absolutely. Many people yes. don't talk about that. Very yeah. good point. Mm. Thank you, Sparky, for that. Uh, Gordon sends us a super sticker. Thank you, Gordon. And Cactus Ray sends us a super sticker. Thank you very much, Cactus Ray. Life of Brian says, appreciate all your efforts. Yet if toppling a fascist global regime were easy, we'd all do it. <laughs> <laughs> it is not easy. It is, it not, is easy. not easy. And of course, if you're talking about fascist regimes, I mean, bear in mind that, of course, they don't believe in democracy. And so it makes it especially difficult to remove them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Kurt says, Alex, I'm, I'm busy with your app. When will Greece drop all 
coup restrictions for EU tourists, any indications? Yes, Kurt is actually working on a Duran TV app. Kurt has done oh, Duran wow. TV, durantv.com, where you can see all our videos streamed 24 hours a day. Wow. And uh, Kurt's going to create an Android app. And I'm wow. very, very much looking forward to that. That, that, that is so very Kurt, exciting. Kurt yeah. is, is, is awesome. And uh, when will Greece drop the coup restrictions for tourists? Any indications? Probably yeah. by by summer as it approaches. Yeah. Whatever Germany does, Mitsudaki yeah. sold. Oh, we'll follow. <laughs> I know quite yet. Yeah. Just yeah. look at what Germany does, and Greece will yes. implement it a couple. Of Again, years later. if there was if there was a serious opposition in Greece, it would have been done sooner. But of yeah. course, in Greece, we don't have an opposition. No. They're all they're all part of the same club. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Guyver Mechten. Guyver Mechten says, "Stop, uh, stop corporatist formation psychosis." Yeah. Good. <laughs> yeah, like that. <laughs> very very creative. Very creative. Thank you for that. And um, Rich says the big game changer will be if Japan joins the Russia-China alliance. Europe is important, but the assets Japan can bring, tech and all, is way more lucrative. It is. Well, indeed, that's a very good point because, of course, Japan, you know, it's interesting to compare Europe with Japan because, of course, the Japanese have developed in so many ways so much more of their technology base and their science base and their AI base than the Europeans have done. And that tells you so much about the paral paralyzing effect of the EU institutions on um, European industrial and technological and scientific developments. But Japan aligning with China and Russia, I have to say for the moment, I just don't see it. I mean, the best you can expect is uh, a reasonably cordial relationship between Japan and China, uh, and Russia, which does not involve into outright friendship. And with between China and Japan, a very, very frosty uh, uh, situation, good economic links, but politically, I can't really see them converging with each other at all. Yeah. Uh, let's see here from locals. Liz Trust was after Boris's job. No doubt Boris noted that. Yeah, <laughs> indeed. Well, indeed. <laughs> and, well, indeed. So that's why he made a foreign secretary. I mean, it's, uh, the, the, I, I think there might be even some truth to this. You know, you, you actually put your major rival in a, po in a post where you know that her incompetence will be exposed. But that, if, that would, if that is true... It tells you so much about the cynicism with which politics is conducted in Britain that, uh, and in, in, in so much of the West now that you put people in really important positions, not so that they can succeed for the good of the country, but so that they can fail. So that they can fail. So that you can stay in power. Yeah. So you can stay in power. Exactly. Yeah, well said. And um, let's see. Leafy Bug says, can the collective West recover from all of this? Well, yes, it can. The time question is, is whether out. it can, is whether it will. And as yeah. Alex said, time is running out. We don't have infinite amount of time. <laughs> and Leafy Bug says, I'm sick of seeing Biden smashing ice creams into his face. <laughs> there's so many There's so many photos, Leafy Bug, of Biden e eating ice cream. It is I incredible. I mean, yeah. I think I've got enough photos of Biden eating ice cream, Alexander, to... To take us through a hundred videos, wow. a <laughs> hundred video thumbnails. <laughs> yeah. Wow! I mean, there are a lot of lot of pictures of Biden eating ice cream. Anyway, Alexander, while we're on the topic of ice cream or or, or uh, enjoying yourself, you have got uh, a beer to drink, I believe, at the pub. We have answered all questions, all our questions, all topics. Uh, Alan, we will we will definitely put live uh, live call in shows. We are working on it. Just keep patient, and we'll get all of that stuff rolling. And um, that's everything. That's well, that's fantastic. That is absolutely fantastic. Well, my 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 uh, John Smiths is coming up soon, and can I just say what a brilliant program this has been? I mean, it's fantastic. Yeah, this is a fun one. Quality. It's been a tremendous fun one. This but, you know, we're talking one, about serious yeah. things. And by the way, I, I'm going to modify a bit of what I said at one point. I said that the two big events were the inflation readout and the Russian-Chinese thing. The truckers issue should not be underestimated. 
if it brings down Trudeau, if it really does succeed, well then, well then it then it, it will be the story of the decade if it brings Absolutely. down Trudeau. Absolutely, exactly, exactly. So I mean, at that point, it would be huge. It will be the story of the freaking decade if that happens, yes. because we're going to yes. see one of these neoliberal uh, tyrants fall. I mean, that's yes. that's going to be yes. Yes. beyond massive. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely, it's not and I think it's going to happen. Yes, he's not losing an election. It is. It is actually fall. That is exactly uh, exactly yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. I think it's going to happen. Yes. I, the only I, I, the only thing that may happen is, like you said, yes. Alexander, his own party may tell him to step aside in order to. Yeah. to to massage the narrative that well the truckers yes. didn't really lead to the downfall exactly. of trudeau it exactly. was you know we also advised yes. him and yes try to put a yes. spin on it exactly yeah yeah but what is it i mean so i i i i take back what i said and i modified uh the truckers thing is huge potentially uh it's big already it could be enormous uh, let's see. Two two super chats. Uh, Zariel says, "Wish you all a great weekend and want one of those new jackets." Zariel, we will have yeah. those ready. Believe me, we are working hard on these. And Duke Luke says, "What about Putin and Klaus at the WEF?" Everyone always talks about Putin being part of the uh, Klaus Schwab uh, WEF class. He he's he plays with Schwab, and I have to say, uh, his last speech there was an extraordinary critique of everything that Schwab thinks of. We actually did a program about it. And it was fascinating to watch Putin make it and to see Klaus Schwab listening and listening as basically his entire philosophy was just dismantled and taken apart. So uh, there's no real understanding or liking between the two. But Schwab likes to bring everybody to his spider's lair and Putin, as I said, liked to tease him, I think. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you to everyone in uh, Locals. Dav Will says, thanks, guys. Off to auto walks and the protest. Dav Will, Godspeed. Godspeed. Godspeed and uh, let us know how everything goes. Uh, thank you to our moderators, Valies, Reckless Abandon, Zarael, Alan Watson. I think I got everybody there who was moderating. Thank you very much to our moderators. And uh, thank you to everyone on YouTube, to all the super chats. Thank you to everyone in the chat. Uh, the conversation was was great. Oh, great awesome. comments, great insights, great analysis. Thank you very much. And to everyone in Locals, thank you as well. Another great conversation that was taking place in Locals. Watch yeah. Viva Fry's coverage on the protest. Yes, Viva Fry is, is doing uh, heroic work. He's Absolutely. doing the work that the media should be doing. But he's putting it on his shoulders and he's doing it. So Absolutely. big, big up for, for uh, Viva Fry. And uh, what else, Alexander? Our history show is history tomorrow. Show. Tomorrow. And we also have the big show with uh, Robert Barnes yes. as well, which we'll put out to most likely tomorrow as well. Absolutely. And we have a lot of big videos this weekend. John, thank you very much for that final super chat. Thank you very much, John. Always giving great analysis on uh, locals. And uh Alexander, any final final words before we sign off for this? Uh, no, well, well, we are we are at a pivotal moment. Let's not let's not. I mean, there's a lot of doom and gloom about you know what the future of the West is. We've been in bad situations in the West before we pulled back, and certainly the US has. But you know, time is not unlimited, and um, you know it is starting to run out, and we can't let ourselves continue to be governed by people like Trudeau. I mean, Liz Truss, I think we can almost disregard. I mean, she's so idiotic, frankly. That I mean, she's she's not consequential. But Trudeau is a sinister figure, in my opinion. I mean, I uh, as I said, I find it difficult, as I've said many times, to be objective about him. But I do find him sinister, just as I found Hillary Clinton sinister. And the sooner he's gone, the better. And if the truck is succeed, and they bring him down. Well, that might be the galvanizing moment that we need. Hey, man's final final super chat and final comment. Hey, man, I leave it to you. And it says Duran because it takes endurance to win anything. Uh -huh. Hey, man, Thank you very much. on that note, we are signing off. Take care, everybody. Have a great, great weekend.